and Maya Oberst. Sixth graders Ellis Sank, Caden Simon, Mason Vatina, and Jackson Weekland placed second in the Allegheny Intermediate Unit Science Bowl at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in February. During the Science Bowl, students competed against others in grades four through six in a variety of hands-on challenges and scavenger hunts. A team of Pine Ridge and Middle School eighth graders placed second in the Western Pennsylvania Science Bowl on March 2nd, competing against 26 teams from the region. The team included Sanaya Aurora, Hans Jam, Ayush Nayar, Anna Maria Parmelanya, and Sanvi Sampier. The bowl required students to answer questions on topics related to science, technology, engineering, and math. The quiz style event helps students expand their science and math knowledge while participating in an exciting competition in which they learn about the importance of teamwork. Pine Richland Middle School's seventh grade Odyssey of the Mind team qualified for the state finals following the Western Regional Competition on March 2nd at Keystone Oaks. Sophia Cosgrove, Katie Glyptis, Ellie Kaufman, Ovini Lianaj, Lydia O'Leary, and Violet Zappos will travel to Swiftwater, Pennsylvania on April 6th with parent coach Mrs. Glyptis and sponsor Mrs. Deal to compete. A high school team that includes five Pine Richland High School students also qualified for the State Odyssey of the Mind Finals, winning first place in their age division and receiving the Renatra Fusca Creativity Award, the highest of all awards given in Odyssey of the Mind for exceptional out-of-the-box creative thinking. The STEAM Studio team includes seniors Nikolai Ezalt, Mia Tuckeron, Connor Foote, and Michael Latari, and junior Jillian Uzelik. Ninth grader Chase Bisti was chosen to participate in the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra's side-by-side -side program following recommendation from teacher Mr. Stillwagon and a competitive audition process. The side-by-side -side program affords high school musicians the experience of rehearsing and performing alongside their Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra counterparts. Students receive personal coaching from PSO musicians, participate in full orchestra rehearsals, collaborate with other student musicians, and perform at a ticketed concert on the Heinz Hall stage in April. Seven Pine Richland students earned five honorable mentions last month in the Pittsburgh Public Theater's Shakespeare Monologue and Scene Contest. Junior John Paul Foligno for Romeo and Juliet, sophomore Grace Lenny for As You Like It, ninth graders Aubrey Christ for Julius Caesar and Bailey Christ for A Midsummer Night's Dream, and senior Jocelyn Rich, junior Grace Kay, and sophomore Jara Kashani for Love's Labor Lost. Junior Blake Fuchs was selected to participate as a national youth correspondent at the 2024 Washington Journalism and Media Conference at George Mason University this summer. Blake was chosen based on his academic accomplishments, interest in excellence in journalism and media studies. He will join a select group of students from the country for an intensive study of journalism and media. Two Pine Richland students were named Students of the Month at A.W. Beatty for January, February. Junior Sid Kiso for Surgical Sciences Technology and Junior Jessica Boy for Culinary Arts. Tomorrow evening, the following Pine Richland High School seniors will be inducted into the National Technical Honor Society through A.W. Beatty. Mintis Ivaska for Network Engineering and Cybersecurity, Luke Polito for Health and Nursing, Nursing Sciences, Jasmine Robinson for Advertising Design, and Logan Tremulak for HVAC. The National Technical Honor Society recognizes the achievements of top career and technical education students. Seniors Kate Crystal, Andy Forrester, and Lauren Wood were recognized by Richmar Rotary as Students of the Month in February for outstanding academic achievement and service. Five Pine Richland High School students qualified for the National Catholic Forensic League Grand National Tournament following the Qualifiers Tournament at Fox Chapel in early March. 138 students from 11 schools competed for a spot to qualify at the National Tournament. Seniors Avi Negrath and Henry Wojcik, junior Thomas DeVito, and sophomore Jiwon Lee qualified for public forum debate, and senior Yash Shah qualified in extemporaneous speaking. The national tournament will be held in Chicago over Memorial Day weekend. Pine Richland's first ever girls wrestling team sent two to the first ever PIAA Girls Western Regional Championship on March 2nd, junior Tiffany Gathers and sophomore Bryn Bosak. Five Pine Richland wrestlers competed in the WPIAL Class 3A Wrestling Championship the first weekend of March. Juniors Dom Ferraro and Von Spencer, sophomore Mac Miller, and ninth graders Max Koser and Alden Rockasey. Von won his second WPIAL Individual Championship. 
Both Vaughn and Dom advanced to the PIAA championship this past weekend in Hershey, where Vaughn won the 3A individual state championship. Following the WPIAL Swimming and Diving Championship the first weekend of March, several Pine Richland students will compete in the PIAA championship later this week at Bucknell University. Junior Sarah Ann Schaefer will compete in the girls 200 yard individual medley and 100 yard breaststroke and ninth grader Allison Showmaker will compete in the girls 100 yard breaststroke. In the girls 200 yard freestyle relay, Sarah Ann and Allison will swim with sophomore Riley Schaefer and ninth grader Bree Arthur. And in the girls 400 yard freestyle relay, Riley, Sarah Ann and Allison will swim with sophomore Anna Showmaker. Senior Ariana Anderson and ninth grader Brooke Rupert will also be at states as relay alternates. Pine Richland School District received two awards of merit from the Pennsylvania School Public Relations Association in the organization's annual Excellence in Education Communications Contest. Awards were earned in the Publications category for the 22-23 Annual Report and in the Writing category for a story about the Electric Bus Initiative. Pine Richland High School will present Mamma Mia this weekend and next in the High School Auditorium. Visit pinerichland.org slash musical to learn more about the show and cast, see photos from rehearsals, and to purchase tickets. And lastly, for in-person recognition, seniors Vasily Boloris, Jocelyn Carreri, Nikolai Easy. Richland, throughout my whole Pine Richland career, I've been involved in football, basketball, student government, and countless extracurricular STEAM opportunities through the GATE program. I'm really appreciative to be recognized for this distinction. It serves as a reward for the hard work I've done throughout high school, but also as encouragement for, what I, for hard work I'm going to put in through the future. Speaking of the future, I plan to go to a four-year university to study mechanical engineering. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jocelyn Carreri, and I just wanted to start off by saying it's a huge honor to receive this award. It's really a motivation for me to continue trying as I move on to college. Um, and throughout my high school career, I've participated in uh, Asian Culture Club, mock trial. I've interned for the 17th uh, U.S. representative um, in this, uh, this area. And then I also started a culture diversity program at some local libraries. And I have to say that the students and the teachers I've met here have been a huge encouragement to everything I've done, really. And for the future, I plan to go to a four-year college. Uh, and I plan to major in biology. Thank you. Hi, my name is Liam Francis. I'm a senior at Pine Ridge High School. I am a fourth year varsity rower. I play violin for the Pine Ridge Orchestra, and I recently completed my Eagle Scout project, which refurbished an outdoor classroom behind Wexford Elementary School. Getting this recognition to me feels rewarding as it recognizes the hard work I've done in and out of the classroom. And my future plans are to study physics at the University of Notre Dame and pursue a Master of Science. Hello, my name is Ben Lyons, and I'm really honored for this award. I think that it really shows all the hard work that I put in studying for all of these tests, and I'm also very honored to be a part of Pine Richland. I've gone to Pine Richland ever since kindergarten, and I think that it's been an essential part in sort of building the community of, you know, who I am today. I'm currently involved with a whole, a whole lot of different clubs. I'm the president of an environmental club. Um, I've been an officer in the programming club, and I'm also involved in Spanish club. I think that this community and sort of allowing me to branch out into other areas has really found, helps me find my academic prowess, and has really pushed me and motivated me to become the student that I am today. I believe we're going to have you shake hands with the board as well. <laughs>
got to draw windows here. Okay. Can't see Miss Turchek. Facility, <laughs> facility <laughs> the There, that works perfect. Ready? Three, two, one. We'll get a few of them. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>
and Jocelyn Seeson from Pine Ridge High School. Thank you so much for letting me speak. Please consider what we have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next online speaker is Leslie Marks. Mr. Stubner. Hello? Hello. Hi, Ms. Marks. Go ahead. You're on with the board. Hi. Thank you so much. I just wanted to address uh, the comments that were brought up last school board meeting about the school counselors in the K-12 guidance curriculum. And just remind everyone that school counselors are the front line for student mental health. So they are at the nexus of all stakeholders that surround a student, the parents, teachers, administrators, community members, mental health and social services, and the, the school board. They use standards, and I know they were questioned last time, uh, the standards used by school counselors are based on research and best practices and are recommended to support student health and wellness. Because school counselors work with all students and provide targeted support and intervention to students in need. They are really like the resource brokers for students and families when they m need more support than they are currently getting. So the Pine Ridge School Counselors K-12 Guidance Plan which is required by the state for all school districts, primarily focuses on career education and post-secondary planning. However, the counselors of Pine Richland included the academic and social emotional goals of the school counselors as well, because school counselors focus on the success of the whole child. So our students are more than robots to perform academically without feelings and emotions, and our students benefit from classroom lessons and groups that focus on such topics including emotion management, self-regulation skills, problem solving, friendship, and social skills to say the least. The preventative education provided through tiered programming, which includes classroom lessons, small groups, and short-term individualized counseling are important, as well as the suicide prevention lessons that are included in the district. And it actually saves lives. So school, school counselors are also more than qualified to create their curriculum. They are licensed educational specialists and they, re, they have master's degrees to say the least. So when they are creating curriculum, they are more than qualified to do that and they use standards to guide their programming. I think it's just important to realize when we're looking at school counselors in general, they really are the heart of the, progr of the programming in our school. They're at the center of everything. Students need these trusted adults in their buildings so that they can uh, rely on them for any support they need. Like I said, we're more than just, our students are more than just robots and these unique, uh, uniquely skilled professionals are the ones who can really bring everything together. The academic, social- 15 second support, warning, please. Thank you. And career um, post-secondary plans for students. So I thank you so much. And I hope that we just keep that in mind as we're moving forward. Okay, thank th you. thank you very much. Our first in-house speaker is Jessica Taylor. Hello, uh, my name is Jessica Taylor. I have three children within the district. Uh, third grader at Hance, a fifth grader at Eden Hall, and a ninth grader at the high school. Uh, so we've been part of Pine Richland for 10 years now. And I am not a public speaker, um, but I felt that it was necessary to come up and be able to voice my support for our school counselors in every single step of the way that my children have been through this school. Um, especially these past few years with my ninth grader and some of her friends who have relied on the school counselors as well as specifically my fifth grader um, who has a lot of emotional uh, support that is needed. She gets outside of school therapy but could not proceed in the classroom without the support that she receives from the school counselors uh, that she received at Hance, uh, that she receives at Eden Hall and being able to make 
her way through those classes um, with the social support, friendship support, uh, she struggles with shutting down in her classes and it really affects her academically. Um, and, and they're there along the way to help her continue to be able to be present in the classrooms. And um, I trust their, their professional uh, input on making this this um, this program, this uh, you know everything that they have set forward to to continue doing in the schools, um, it is for our children's benefits, and I don't know if my children would be able to continue in the school if it wasn't for the counselors, and I am so grateful for them along every step of the way. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Katie Postrick. Hi, I'm Katie Postrich. I have three kids also in the district and currently in fifth, seventh, and ninth grades. <clears throat> I did send this letter to the board in longer context. I've cut out some to try to keep to the three minute mark, but it's really important to me to read it out loud for all the people here and to make sure that you actually read it because I never get an acknowledgement except for Mrs. Fortier. Um, so I appreciate that our counselors and advisory council members see and are responding to the need for counselors to be more proactive than reactive in response to the current needs of the students by clearly presenting the curriculum map and how the domains of each component, both academic career and social emotional, will be addressed. I was surprised to see Ms. Turchuk listed as community member on the advisory council when she expressed concern over the volume of content in the curriculum, as I don't recall prior discussions about this on previous presentations. When I looked at the content, I found very few lessons that are not already happening in the classrooms and having children currently in all three of those grades, I clearly, clearly remember getting information about many of the lessons listed. Being almost four years out from COVID, I'm seeing just how each of these three components are playing out for my family. My youngest was in first when COVID hit and what I'm seeing her, in her and her classmates is that the foundation of academics seems to have suffered the most. She required counseling deal, dealing with testing anxiety that stemmed from trying to meet the academic requirements that persisted despite not having that solid foundation that would have normally been built. My social butterfly was in third grade and in sixth grade it became clear that she had friends, she and her friends, had not been able to really develop those close intimate friendships due to varied schedules. Her counselors worked through the SEL skills required to form strong and healthy bonds with her friends while also staying true to herself as she was really getting into the normal teen issues. My oldest was in fifth grade and luckily had a brief intro to Beatty which provided some hope when academics became more challenging and he hadn't found a core social group. His counselors continued to work with him in seventh and eighth grades and he has been able to visualize a future without a traditional college pathway now hoping to be accepted into Beatty next year and it's working with the counselors in the high school a lot. I bring the examples of my children to you because I would like to remind you that you are representing all students in your decisions. I recall a time in recent PR history when multiple students claimed their own lives in a very short period of time. The district has worked hard to build in lessons and provide appropriate resources surrounding suicide prevention, resulting in a significant decline in cases. I am concerned that Ms. Brusalis and Ms. Hillman's questions focused on whether or not SEL was worthy of having a curriculum and seemed to doubt that our certified counseling staff should be the ones creating it. While I understand their claim was solely for clarification, given recent discussions regarding SEL at prior board meetings, I do question the true intent. I would certainly hope that with the trans transparency of the curriculum provided, 15 second one. it will now be easy to see that the lessons are basic and really are just teaching the kids how to be good and supportive friends while also learning how to take care of their own social emotional needs. Academics can and will catch up again. But if we okay, can be a district th thank, thank that you stands for emotional well-being of our up. kids, as much as we stand for having both academic and career-minded children, then that's a district I can be proud of. So please okay, vote thank yes you. to approving the counseling plan. Thank you. I just want to remind everybody, and I know we do this a couple of times and there's always new speakers, when you address the board, please try to address the board in totality, not individually. We have a policy in school that that's what we follow. So thank you very much. Okay, next speaker, please. Next speaker is Brittany Kindersmith. Good evening, my name is Brittany Kindersmith. I have two kids in the district and I live on Hart Road. 
First, I wanted to say thank you to the PTO members at Hans who helped put on the book fair last week. Um, my kids really love the book fair and everyone in our house is grateful for the immense effort that it takes the volunteers. Uh, they spend so much time making it like uniquely fun with a different theme each semester. Uh, Next, I wanted to express my hope that you all will pass the counseling curriculum this evening. At the January 22nd meeting, some members asked pointed questions about whether the state required SEL that made it seem like those asking do not like the SEL portions of the curriculum. Although some board members may not love the idea of SEL in school, all board members are charged with representing the community's wishes. In 2016, a petition was signed by more than 1,400 parents which demanded that district officials do something to combat the high number of suicides Pine Richland had seen in the immediate years prior. Most of these people still live here and still want the counselors to be doing all they can to prevent even one more child from taking their own life. The community has been pretty clear on this issue. They want the kids to feel supported at school, as I am sure all of you do. Pine Ridge and loves to boast about its academic standards and how rigorous they are, but while pushing our kids to be the best that they can, we must recognize the pressure that that puts them under and empower our school staff to help them manage that pressure. The counselor's expertise, along with the input of the advisory council, has led to this curriculum, which all involved should be incredibly proud of, and I am urging you to pass it. Finally, I am wondering how much time was spent by board members reaching out to counselors on, um, or members of the advisory committee discussing concerns and possible resolutions in the time since June of 2023 when the counseling IDPR was presented versus how much time recently was spent dealing with the new solicitor RFPs and the subsequent hiring process because there doesn't seem to be a pressing need to replace our solicitor of 60 years but this plan is due to the state by March 30th. It feels as though limited experience on the board with all of you combined having 20 years total and one of those belonging, one, sorry, 12 of those years belonging to one person alone is causing poor governance. You all are volunteers and humans with families and you only have so much time and energy. Is it being spent ensuring our kids are getting what they need to succeed? Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Our, our next speaker is Allison Duncan. Hi, my name is Allison Duncan. I live at 134 Tanglewood Drive, and I have two PR alumni. Um, first off, I want to start with saying it's pretty hypocritical for the board to expect community members not to address you individually when one of your board members has used my name in their email responses to other community members. And this was an email that had nothing to do with me. So you might want to think about that, Mrs. Turchik. Um, that aside, I'm here to show support for our education professionals, um, including teachers, librarians, counselors, and administrators. I respect not just their training, continued education, and expertise, but also the experience they've gained from working with our children. Our educators do what they do because they want to help kids learn. So I ask the board, what is driving the decisions that you're making? How will reducing support services and social emotional learning help our kids? That's easy. It won't. Our kids need career counseling, yes, but they also benefit from academic counseling and social, social and emotional learning. Good social skills lead to better learning. Emotional well-being leads to better learning. Having someone to talk to at school when you have worries or problems leads to better learning. Good organizations, organizational skills lead to better learning. Don't our kids deserve this? All of this. So I'm asking you to let our educational professionals do their jobs. You wouldn't want English teachers giving you HVAC advice on the end. You, wouldn't, you would probably take offense at a librarian telling you how to write a legal brief. And you would probably roll your eyes if a public school counselor gave you talking points for one of your school choice panels or standing up to the PA school board association, sorry. Let our professionals do their jobs. 
and you focus on doing your job the right way. By doing your homework before you come in here and by making decisions for no goal other than benefiting Pine Ridgeland students and their educations. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lauren Edwards. Hello, my name is Lauren Edwards and I have uh, one child at Richland in first grade and one more coming up in the fall. I'm here tonight to address the matter of the counseling curriculum and remind the board that many have stood up here and have tried to be heard on this important issue. I came up here for the first time 14 months ago to voice my concerns on how the social and emotional learning standards for social skills specifically were recently amended by the American School Counselor Association to include personal values-based principles, which I feel are the domain of the family and should never be included in public education setting. Myself and others have vocalized our sincere concern for having teachers and counselors take on an expanded focus of mental health with social and emotional learning taking away academic time to focus on non-academic topics and subject all students to counseling curriculum, whether it's needed or not. It would seem that all these concerns have been dismissed time and time again, as here we are tonight still having the same conversation. Those of us who are not in favor of the counseling curriculum have valid belief systems that support this point of view. I also understand that those who support the counseling curriculum have their own belief systems, which are equally valid. Tonight is not about changing anyone's mind on the issues of counseling curriculums or the need for social and emotional learning. Tonight is about moving forward in a direction that supports the diverse needs of a community. It is my plea to the board to hear the families that do not want to be forced to participate in a mandated counseling curriculum. I ask that you vote to support a counseling curriculum that only satisfies the minimum state requirements of career and workforce education. Should any counseling curriculum proceed that is over and above these state minimum requirements, I humbly request that that is curriculum be offered only on an elective basis and parental opt-in. It is not my goal to stand in the way of something that someone else would deem valuable. I just ask that I am also given the opportunity to choose what is valuable to my own family. Thank you to the board for listening to my concerns and for everything that has been done on your part to understand this complicated issue more completely and provide good governance. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amy Cray. Okay, good evening. Thank you for listening to us and thank you for all the parents on either side coming out and speaking. Tonight, I wanted to read um, some results from Education Week article that was published this year. Education Week is a publication that probably most of our superintendents and counselors and teachers all subscribe to. It touts itself as America's most trusted resource for K through 12 news and information. In their article that was titled, Do pa Does Parents' Involvement Really Help Students? Here's what the research says. Education Week cites studies from both the APA and John Hopkins University Center on the school that reviewed over 448 independent studies on parent involvement. These studies found that, one, more parental involvement leads to improved academic outcomes, higher percent of proficiency on math and reading scores. Two, parent involvement benefits social emotional outcomes, attitudes about school and attention in the classroom. And three, the positive effects from parent involvement does not discriminate based on race or socioeconomic differences. These studies were really conclusive on how vital the impacts of parent involvement was on their kids' academic and their mental health. Why? Because parents know their child best. 
and the shift that is occurring away from academics to mental health means that the finite amount of resources during the day, the week, the quarter are being shifted. I appreciate every parent in here who is standing up and speaking about their own child, and so I'm gonna speak specifically about my own child. Because some here have young kids and they don't maybe see the cumulative effect of these hours, these days, these weeks, these quarters, how they add up. But as a parent of a high schooler who struggles in math, who's getting ready for the SATs, and who's preparing for college, I see that time is shortening more and more and time being shifted away from academics is detrimental specifically to him. So the resources of time that are spent in class being shifted uh, to assembly schedules where they lose time out of their schedule in every single class implemented routinely during the year. Last week, many juniors were preparing for their SATs on top of their regular classes, and the shift of resources to an assembly schedule was a, really, a very real thing and a stressful thing. Assembly schedules shorten each class period during the day, for those who don't know. Um, I really appreciated that there was an opt-out available, making it so that I could opt my son out of the assembly so that he could then go spend time in an area where he was struggling, which is math. 15 These, second warning. Thank you. These resources also happen in the guidance counselor. It's been a month and my son still has not been able to get a meeting with his guidance counselor to talk about the area that he's struggling with. So I would just ask with finite resources. Okay, T time's up, thank, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Therese Dawson. Hello, I have um, three successful graduates from Pine Richland and I'm currently a taxpayer. And my concern is um, that we are in a process right now of reviewing the counseling curriculum um, proposal that really does go, um, it's a stretch. Um, the fact is that counselors who are deemed the experts are no more expert at um, being a parent to our children as is stated by several others. To become a school counselor, there is criteria, but to deem them mental health professionals is simply untrue. My students, my kids when they were students, did use their counselors when they needed, and they were very helpful, and I appreciate them. However, use of a counselor should be an opt-in, um, not an opt-out. Parents know their students the best, and they should be the ones guiding their career path with the intimate details that they know about their students. When they need counselors to help flush through that thing, that would be fine. Secondly, the state and federal agencies have requirements for school districts to provide counseling services as stated in Policy 112, but there is no requirement for in-class curriculum. And it really is a personal choice because we should be focused on learning for every student every day. PR counselors and PR administration seek to adopt social emotional framework as outlined by the American School Counselors Association and that simply is not a requirement in the state. So with our 80% tax dollars that support from our homes, support this district, I'm asking you to vote no to what I would consider to be an unnecessary and unreasonable use of school counselors because they are needed for more specific intervention. And if they're in classrooms, what will we do? Hire more counselors? We don't need more counselors. We need a program that fits the needs of the community and satisfies the state requirements. That's it. That's all we need. And that's how I want you to spend our tax dollars, and mine in particular. Let's give the power back to the parents and let them counsel their own students. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Todd Brown. My name is Todd Brown. I live at Eagle Court in Wexford, Pennsylvania. I'm here on a different topic. It's come to my attention and attention to people in the community. 
that one of the four finalists for a solicitor or counselor for the school board is a law firm that unfortunately has a history of being involved with frivolous lawsuits. The reason that I bring that up is because this board is charged with doing the, making the proper choice of allocating resources in a way which benefits the school district and doesn't cost us more money. The law firm I'm referring to is Dillon McCandless. It is the only law firm of the four law firms that are being considered right now by this board that doesn't have a current working relationship with the school board. The case that I'm concerned about that I did a little research on recently this week was uh, uh, the company, a corporation for Trump as president versus Bukvar, which was filed shortly after the 2020 election. In that case, there were allegations made about uh, mail-in ballots being illegal and also about uh, voting polling monitors not having equal access to the uh, polling stations. That case went before the Middle District of Pennsylvania and it was found that there were no facts to support the case and there was no law to support the remedy that was asked for, which was in part the elimination of over 7 million valid votes uh, to decertify them and not count them in the election. That case then went to the Third Circuit, where a three-judge panel of Republicans, with the decision being written by a Trump appointee saying there were no facts to support this claim and there was no law to support these claims. Now, why do I bring that up in relation to this law firm? The reason is, after that case was filed, while that case was filed, while the lack of facts and the lack of legal support was clearly on the docket, this law firm intervened on the side of the Trump administration, which lacked facts and lacked the law to support it. And Rudy Giuliani was the lead attorney in that case. Because of that case, a three-person panel in the District of Columbia has voted to disbar him, and we're pending the final outcome of that. So the reason they're doing that is because the case was frivolous. It was only politically motivated. If Fifteen you, second warning. If you hire a law firm, you want a law firm that exercises good judgment in the cases that it joins with. You want a law firm that is not motivated by politics that will lose this school board money. Okay, and time's so up. You, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll just thank finish you. with this one point. You, what the decision you should make, you have three good options, but that fourth one is clearly politically motivated. Please decide against it. All right, thank you. Next speaker is Bree Bell. Bree. Oh. Uh, good evening. My name is Brianna Bear, and I live on Richland Road. I'm a mom of four with one at Eden Hall and one at Hance. I'm speaking tonight to express my concern over the board's recent actions. I was concerned with the haphazard RFP proposal that seemingly came out of the blue at the first meeting of the new year. I was increasingly di or incredibly disturbed to see that the board included Dylan McCandless, a far-right ideological law firm, in its short list of possible school solicitors. This is a firm that has doubled the legal cost of a local district it represents and largely works outside of our area. The board claimed good business sense was the reason behind the RFP. In what world would the PR school board be entertaining hiring such a law firm? Where is the good business sense in that? Was this sloppy work by the board, who perhaps didn't do very basic research to know this firm's stance, or is it intentional? Is this the type of firm you want in our district, because this is the path you'd like our district to take? I'd just like to remind you all that the community is paying attention. We're paying attention to how you've had recent meetings filled with teachers and staff staying after hours as their core text and curriculum proposals are being presented and you've hardly been bothered to address them or engage them in any sort of substantial dialogue yet shamelessly question their qualifications and question their motives and by tabling decisions you delay their ability to prepare for the upcoming school year despite some of these items being proposed eight months ago or more <clears throat> most recently we've seen this with the concerning attitude you've taken to the uh, social emotional learning curriculum I would love to hear the motivation behind the questioning of the required versus recommended curriculum components. 
for I've been hard pressed to interpret it in any other way than that you're looking to achieve only the bare minimum. This is a shameful approach to take, yet I have no doubt that's the goal some of you have in mind. It fits with this very narrow, brazenly selfish thinking that's becoming the norm among our board members, that if you personally don't like the idea of a school counselor being able to help a student in need, then no student should have that access, as if they're not serving a crucial and potentially life-saving role in those students' lives. As a parent, I certainly would hope my child would feel comfortable coming to me with any serious problems, but it'd be foolish of me to assume that every child's in the same position. And if my child didn't feel comfortable coming to me, I would absolutely hope there's a school counselor there to help them however they can. We're all on different paths here, folks. By sowing down the qualifications of our counselors, librarians, teachers, and administration, who are you trying to help? What aim are you trying to achieve? Your message has not been settled. We see it with the support of book bans, with questioning our guidance counselors in Cortex, with essentially shutting down DEI, and with the frankly embarrassing inclusion of an ideological law firm as a candidate for school solicitor. We will have marginalized students in our community regardless of your actions, but I implore you to stop making decisions to make their paths harder. These students will continue to have our over overwhelming support, no matter what big or small or loud or quiet moves you make to try and warning. them down. You are here to serve the public, not your own narrow interest. You cannot turn back the clock to a simpler time, no matter how much more comfortable you think that will make you feel. You're here to help every student every day. Please start acting like it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mike Barber. Hello, Mike Barber from Richland Road. Dr. Miller, thank you. Dr. J, thank you. Dr. P, thank you. <clears throat> I see a lot of staff here again. <clears throat> I want to say thank you. Um, the hours that you all put in um, are just amazing and go unaccounted for. Um, we were at two open houses in the past few days. Teachers are there. The amazing work that they're putting in is on display and it you can feel it as you walk in the, in the building. Um, <clears throat> we moved to PR because of the, the reputation of the, the board and the education opportunities that are offered. If we wanted to move where taxes are good, we would have moved to Mars and, or Butler County, but we moved specifically to Pine Richland because of the reputation that these administrators and teachers and all these people who sink their heart and <clears throat> energy into our kids. It is not because of the school board, so I am here to offer support for the teacher recommendation of Angel of Greenwood. Um, they were not trying to remove a ninth grade cork text, um, so I don't know why we're not approving it. Um, support for K through 12 um, counselors. Miss Godina's here, the Hans uh, counselor who does an amazing job. The hours that she puts in and the work that she puts in is um, remarkable. And um, I know for a fact that I've seen her at a ton of school events and I haven't seen any of you guys there at the in-depth program reviews you could have come as a parent as a board member and none of you guys were at the guidance counselor in-depth program review as a board member if you want more parental involvement there are opportunities it's there step up we just had a pto election you know how many people were uh, nominated one for each position there is work. If you want more involvement from parents, step up, parents. It seemed like the earlier uh, parent could have been more involved, and then their child wouldn't have been falling behind academically. Parental involvement, always an option. Our next speaker is Donna Azar. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Donna Azar. I live on English Farm Drive. I have twin boys in the district. Today I want to talk about something important, social emotional learning or SEL. For those of you who aren't familiar, 
SEL research supporting social and emotional needs of students has been around since the 1960s. It's nothing new. SEL helps us to understand ourselves, manage our emotions, build healthy relationships, and make responsible decisions. Why does SEL matter? Think about it. School isn't just about math tests and history projects. It's about preparing us for life. SEL equips us with the skills to navigate challenges, be good friends, and succeed in whatever we choose to do. My son has autism, specifically Asperger's. Asperger's is a, dif is a disability that makes it difficult to pick up on subtle cues of social interaction, like facial expressions, body language, and tone of voice. Could you imagine having a strong desire for social connections and friendships? But because you lack executive functioning skills, making friends feels like an impossible task. But the good news is these are skills. And skills can be taught. Skills, SEL teaches skills like emotional identification, self-regulation, and relationship building. I would like to give a few examples of how SEL sprinkled in school has helped my family. It's not this separate class. It's sprinkled throughout the school experience. At Wexford Elementary, I expressed my concerns to the school counselor that we needed support. We would be grateful for any tools to put in our tool belt to help our son. Praying there were friend building skills she could teach us. She immediately enrolled my son in a friend group that takes place once a week during his lunch. He gets to pick a friend to sit with and he has a chance to learn and practice skills to make friends during his own lunch time. Last year, my other son was getting repeatedly pushed to the ground at recess. I asked my son what he did in response and he said, nothing, mom, you always told us Nonviolence is the way. Again, I turned to the school counselor for advice and for her best practices to handle these situations. You have a 15 second Girls warning. aren't that aggressive. After all, she deals with adolescents every single day and is trained in how to mediate conflicts peacefully among students. She offered to role play with him on what to do next in that scenario. Okay, it was fantastic. Thank, thank you, your time is up. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. I urge you to keep SEL in the current comprehensive guidance plan. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joel Benson. Joel Benson, uh, Grandview Drive in Gibsonia. Um, I had two kids that went through the school system and became teachers because of the teachers um, and it, my son's kindergarten teacher is sitting behind me. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, became teachers because of the educational experience um, that they had here. My spouse was an occupational therapist who did uh, therapy in school systems all over the North Hills. And I heard for years from them about the social and emotional challenges that the kids brought to school and came to school with. My two kids who are teachers now speak of this all the time and the challenges that they have. Again, our tagline has been mentioned several times, every uh, education every day for every kid. Well, not every kid comes to school every day with healthy emotional support from home. And so those kids that don't need the support and encouragement of the counselors and the other folks that help them in uh, the school system. Um, my daughter reminded me that for years this has been going on. They used to sing a song called Don't Laugh at Me when she was in elementary school. The superintendent's nodding his head. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's a song that they sang, you know, my, my daughter would have been in kindergarten almost 30 years ago. So that's something that's been around for a long time. Kids need to learn life skills to be successful. Confidence building, belonging, friendship, teamwork, emotional management, character building, all these things help them build social, emotional, and academic um, success. If the, if the, if the title of the program is a problem, change it to life skills. 
because that's really what the counselors are helping the kids work on. If this SEL is a buzzword that causes problems, change it to life skills because the life skills that the kids are learning in these programs are important and essential for their academic and their life in general. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Williams, That's how many it. more speakers are left? Mr. Benson was our last one. That was the last mm -hmm. one. The how appropriate. Up. We finished in an hour's time frame, which is allowable. So thank you. Okay, let's, let's move on the agenda. Um, uh, 1.04 correspondence. The following people emailed the board. Julie Wolsick regarding board behavior, Ann Russell regarding SEL programming, Janie Tosh regarding listening and trusting school professionals, Chuck Brem regarding SEL programming, Allison Duncan regarding board behavior and legal services finalists, Mike Barber regarding the shift of seating in the boardroom in ninth grade core text, Rebecca Hoffman regarding board members as leaders, Shelley Ranallo regarding the school counseling curriculum, Christy Herra regarding the K-12 school counseling plan. Following people emailed the board in support of the K-12 Comprehensive School Counseling Plan, Jennifer Buse, Katie Postrich, Katie Vaught, N Nyla Griffin, Adriana Al Alatori, Brittany Kindersmith. The following people emailed the board regarding choosing a school solicitor, Chris Bono, Louise Cashman, Julie Savegi, Kimberly Van Deel, uh, Anna Azar, Dana Azar, sorry, Jennifer Buse, Emily Rababero, Katie Vaught, Amanda Cook, Adriana Alatori, Lynn Henninger, Don Augustine, John Love, Julie Wasik, Rebecca Hoffman, Nick Waryanka, Margaret Richardson, and Brittany Kindersmith. Very good, thank you. Okay, item 1.05, minutes for approval. Um, we have a motion to approve the minutes meetings as attached. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Yes. 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 All opposed? Motion passes, thank you. Okay, 1.06, legal services, solicitor engagement. Um, we have a motion to retain Tucker Ahrensburg, uh, PC, as a school solicitor for the Pine Richland School District, effective immediately per the attached engagement letter. Second. We have a motion and second. And do we have any discussion? All in favor? Yes. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. At this time, I'd, I'd like to invite Matt Hoffman, uh, our solicitor for Aaron's Arbor, to come to the front and take a seat, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. We look forward to working with you. All right, welcome, Matt. Okay, moving on to item 1.07, legal services, continued limited engagement. Um, we have an action item, motion to approve Mrs. Jamie Doherty from GRB to continue representation on several current and pending matters related to litigation, personnel, construction, and a student matter. Second. Motion's been um, made and seconded. Um, any discussion on this one? All in favor? Yes. 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 All opposed? Motion passes, thank you. Okay, moving on to item 2.01, Strategic Plan Board Goals. This is for discussion. There, there are two points I want to make on the one uh, today. A batch policy review and any related administrative reg regulations on 300s. We actually have this in the agenda later on. Um, Mike, I think you have this, and we'll cover that. So that's something for the board to make sure we go through and understand. Uh, number two is the annual or biannual school visitations with topics determined by areas of current focus with an opportunity for board debrief and communication to the community. And I'd like the board to discuss um, uh, picking a school that we can, in, if we can pick some dates, we'll try to do it within a time frame that can work out with the school. But I'd like to you know, have some ideas around where we think we would like to, to visit. Mm. Oh. Oh, go ahead, I just say, Dr. typically we have done a couple of different levels, yeah. so even in a half day we can hit two or three schools and see specific programs, which is beneficial. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. I wanted to suggest Wexford because we do have some major projects coming up there. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. And I know that's one that some of the board members that are already on the board, we haven't visited Wexford yet, so. Yeah. And I would like if we could, like, um, when we did it last time, or, t you know, uh, we got to talk to the high school, um, the, the high school or kids, the students, the, I don't know if it's a leadership group or something. I really like that part of it, if we can include that when we go to the high school. Okay. 
So I got Wexford, uh, the high school, um, for the first visit. I mean, this won't be our last, but is, is that appropriate for everyone? Any other comments? I mentioned last time the Pays Lab at the high school at is the one high of school, the components yeah. we want people to see. Mm -hmm. Okay, what was the lab? I missed the name. The Pays Lab. It's a practical experiences lab for okay. students in the program to actually do jobs and mm -hmm. understand what that looks like. Okay, so we'll work together and trying to find an appropriate date um, that fits everybody's needs, and you know, throw some dates out there. Uh, not right, not right now, but we can do this through email and stuff, and then we'll make that happen. Okay, cool. very good. Anything else? All right, good. Thank you. All right, um, moving on to item three, three point zero one consent, consent agenda. We have an action item: motion to approve all of the items three point zero two through three point zero nine as listed below. Second. Okay, motion's been made and been now been seconded. Um, any discussion, any one of those items? All right, all in favor? Yes. 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 All opposed? Motion passes, thank you. Okay, Mark, I'll turn it over to you on the finance. Okay. Item 4.01. Motion to approve the financial reports dated January 31st, 2024, and accounts payable dated March 11th, 2024, in the amount of $58,031.52, and paid accounts for February, March, in the amount of $2,955,948.40 as listed. Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on this item? All in favor? Yes. yes. All opposed? Okay, motion passes. Item 4.02, motion to approve budget transfers in the amount of $222,134.49 as attached. Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on that item? Okay, all in favor? Yes. 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 All opposed? Okay, motion passes. Item 4.03, motion to approve the 2024-25 AIU Program of Services budget as attached. Second. All right, motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. 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 All opposed? Okay, motion passes. Item 4.04 is an informational item. In the April, at the April planning meeting, we'll be asked to approve AIU policies, procedures, and use of funds, which is an annual approval. Uh, it's related to our use of the money uh, that we get through uh, IDEA. So nothing new there. Okay. Item 4.05, also informational for the April planning meeting, which is also an annual thing that we do, uh, where we authorize our solicitor uh, to uh, initiate um, tax appeals where tax is generated uh, the delta between um, what we would get as a district from the revenue uh, on the property when it dif differs more than a thousand dollars so if, if a, uh, uh, a non newly constructed property is sold if that new price deviates from the assessed value where it would generate um, more than a thousand dollars difference to the district we will appeal that and if it doesn't then we won't so we're going to authorize our new solicitor to handle that for us for the first time item 4.06 is a discussion item and so there are two attachments in the public content and this came about because Mr. Morissette had asked me about maybe a different structure, and this is broader than just finance, but we're going to talk about it in the, fi in the context of finance. But I would, I would argue that if we agree that this is the right thing to do for finance, we should also do it for every other topic that we have a joint governance uh, board for. <clears throat> so, so his idea was, we, you know, we should have committees, you think of them as subcommittees, a subset of the board, and during their meetings, they would get into the weeds, more in the weeds, uh, on those particular topics. And those committees are comprised of four members that do that. The meetings are open to any board member and the public, just like they are now. 
Uh, but the difference is that there would be an expectation of those four members of the subcommittee to be present and to really put in the time to understand the minutia of each of each topic and then bring an executive summary to the full board to educate the board on on various things that we're asked to to vote upon and so when you when you kind of asked me about that Phil I said well as it turns out we used to do that <laughs> and they were called um, they were called committees now we call them joints governance so what i what i did was i just wanted to inform everyone here on the progression uh, so uh, policy 006 addresses this this topic and if you pull up the one attachment that is uh, last revised so it would be the first attachment last, last revised april 12th of 2021 so in that, if you go all the way to the end, and this is the red line version, so you can see what was changed. So if you go to, so on page seven of 10, mm -hmm. uh, you can see that we changed it from a, a label of work sessions to board governance meetings. And that's what we have today. Uh, and so, uh, and now there was a, it, it just so happened in this year of 2021, we actually changed this policy twice. So if you pull up the other attachment, <clears throat> um, so if you go to the same page, page seven, you can see that at that time, oh, I'm sorry, page six, you can see that the red lined actually uses the word committee. And then we went to, we changed the label to a work session, which then was then changed to joint governance. So from a, from a terminology standpoint, I wanted to just show you the evolution. And uh, now the, the intentions were, were well-intentioned. I think there was, a, at the time, we were not getting, we wanted to see better attendance from the full board at the committee meetings. And even within the subcommittees, we weren't getting every member of the subcommittee present on a regular basis. So we had issue of attendance. And so we, that was sort of the initial motivation. And this was supported by the, the board at that time, uh, where we would encourage more full board participation in these meetings that would require everyone to get in the weeds more. So, uh, so we've retained that, you know, for the last few years. And for those that are new, and if, it, if you kind of feel like you're trying to, you need to learn everything about everything. That's kind of why it feels that way. And it is overwhelming. So uh, if we do want to go back, whether we call them, it doesn't matter what we call them, but if we wanted to change the spirit of these committee meetings and go back to what we once did, I thought they were effective. I, I, at the end of the day, I agreed to, to change because the, there, there was sort of a, a consensus to do that. But I thought the way the committees worked were effective uh, each each of us will be on one or two. Uh, we'll be the, uh, each of us will probably be asked to be chair of one or you know and sort of the subject matter lead is what we call that now. But like so finance, I would be the chair of the finance, and I would still do what I try to do now, which is synthesize the granularity that we get from the administration and kind of give you guys a higher level executive summary, sort of a layperson understanding on on the, just the the most important stuff and. Um, and, and every chair of each committee would, would be tasked to do the same for their committee. So, you know, academic would be one that I would lean on, say, Christina, to serve as that chairperson to provide me just the high level if I can't make every academic uh, committee meeting. So, so that's why this was here. And um, it, again, if we, we would want to change this policy back to be, to be consistent with what we, how we operate, what we call them. And then we would also change the expectations of who would attend. It doesn't mean that if you're not on a committee that you abdicate your responsibility of being in the know, being educated, so that when you vote, you, you know what you're voting on. But it does relieve some of the pressure of feeling like you have to know everything about every topic, which is definitely overwhelming. Yeah, a good example was the 27th of February when we met to talk about academics. It, of course, the whole board was here, right? But knowing what we know and how we're talking if we had a subcommittee that would have gotten together nailed all that down and then we brought it back to the board in total then we'd have a little bit more information to share and how that all worked out and so that was one example 
Yeah, yeah. that's an example. Yeah. I I, oh, go ahead, Ashley. Okay, I was just gonna ask. I'm a little, conf I, I see it as pretty much being the same thing, correct? Like, it would be done in public, so as far as the academic achievement meeting that happened on the 27th, it would still happen in the public, correct? It wouldn't be off. It's very, you're right, actually. No, it's very same Okay, so I guess my question is, so it seemed like in the past, historically, it was changed because of attendance, which seemed to imply that there wasn't enough engagement. Correct. Okay, so is there a, is there a reason to think that I guess I don't understand the well, difference. Well, it's a, think of expectations, right? So if when we went to joint governance meetings, every board member was expected to be there. And there, if you weren't, just like if you don't show up at these meetings, there's consequences for your lack of attendance. So it, it starts with the expectation of your presence in these meetings. Okay, so would we go back and redo it for, would we change everything to be, instead well, I, of joint governance, they'd all turn into committee? I guess that's where I'm not. Well, that's where I, that's for us to decide. So tonight we're just speaking to finance. We're Correct. not speaking to the whole totality. I, we could do whatever we want. Um, it's up to us. I would like to be consistent. Okay. If so, if we do it for one, we should do it for them all. And, and, and just because we would do this, it's a nuance. So let's say we do this, and there's four members, say, on the finance committee, and we have a finance committee meeting. We would, we would expect all four of those members to be present. The other five board members are off the hook. If you can't make it, don't feel pressure. If you want to, we, you're still invited, still mm -hmm. show. That would be the difference. It's really a subtle difference. Okay, and then as far as, an, like, so if the four members are the only ones that attend, how, does, how do you guys distribute the information to us? Is it in a public setting or it is it? It would be in, in, in. So it would be in the general meeting. That's right. Yes. Yeah. I, okay. have a, I, I think I have, like, the same question as probably Ashley because I'm just trying to wrap my brain on how this would work. So, for example, like, now we have finance joint governance meeting. Like, I think our next one's in May. So if we had a committee, the four people would go to that meeting and kind of hash it out. And then when, we, when it's on the agenda item later on in that meeting, it's like that's when they relay all the information to the board? Or is it more yeah. of a... Um, more of a more of a meeting I'm just yeah so if you think we don't have one on tonight's agenda but think uh, we had uh, in the last meeting we had a we had a get academic achievement the last meeting right mm -hmm. and then in the general meeting there was a an item it said summary of the academic joint governance meeting right and we kind of glance over that right now but that's where there there would be sort of that committee chair okay. presenting what was discussed that's where the full board would learn in the language of the committee chair, what was talked so, about. So, like, okay, like, go back to academic achievement. So that's Christina, correct? Right. right? Mm -hmm. And look, that's look. Okay, so it would be like Christina and three other board members, and then so everybody would get all the information. At like that we time. would be doing it all together, right? Okay. Everyone would get it at that time, and it would be. It would be presented by a colleague on the board in their own language. Uh, I think I call it an executive summary. So if you're my audience. So if, if I got in the weeds with Mr. Justwit and the committee on finance, and then we're now in the general meeting, and, and my job is to inform you guys on what we talked about, I would present it in your language, not the not the uh, you know the expert in the on the administrative side, and in a more of an executive executive summary form. So it would be more collaborative, like more, instead of everyone yeah. just talking, like we could chime in because we were at the meeting. I mean, I do, I kind of like the more collaborative part of it. I, I don't know, I just have to, have to think about it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, that's, so <laughs> Phil, just, Phil asked me to l at least talk about this just yeah. to educate everybody. Yeah. Ash, um, did you have something? I was, oh. I was going to just. I couldn't hear the, whose yeah, voice yeah, it was. Three of oh. us talked at the same time. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. So my opinion, this is my opinion of taking this on is I feel like finance in particular is something that all of us should probably be aware of because just our roles that we play. Um, I know that we hear quite often, I'm a taxpayer, we're accountable to you know how we spend and I feel like putting it into committee and then releasing some, like you know, making it not as, because joint governance meetings, we can meet, like if you can't make it, some people miss. But I feel like it's kind of, it might be important to have that feeling of you need to be there, especially since this is one of our overarching things that defines what we do as a board. So I, I am on the side of we should stick with the governance, at least for finance, because of the role we all play in it. 
that it shouldn't be watered down to just four. So that's just my take on it. Points? Uh, my question was, will it be recorded or would it be like you could zoom in if you couldn't be here in person? Sure. Yeah, yeah. no change to that. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes during our joint governance meetings, we've had presenters come. Mm -hmm. So would we have those presenters attend the regular meeting, um, just the you know, our regular planning meetings? We could, uh, that's is a that good how, question. Is I, that how you've handled it in the past? Uh, not necessarily, but it doesn't mean we couldn't do that now. Okay. Yeah. So like Tony Masitti, right? Yeah. He would have came to the committee meeting. He wouldn't necessarily have been at the general meeting, but we could ask him to stick around and, yeah. So, yeah, we're in control of that. So yeah. we don't have to decide tonight, but uh, but I just you know Phil asked me to talk about it to stimulate some yeah. discussion. Mm -hmm. The the point on the fine, uh, Mike, a comment about the finance side. When we review the finance and you know we we walk through it, there's a lot of detail there, and we've already gone through the budget and there weren't a lot of questions. Okay, and the, what the governance thing does is it sits down and it, and it makes accountable four people with Mark's leadership, and we say. You roll up your sleeves, you get comfortable with the budget, make, you make sure if you have questions, you make sure that we understand it, we communicate it back. Now, Ashley, absolutely, one point that Mark made was, if you feel it that you wanna be there as a board member, absolutely, 100%, you, you, you come. But it gives others who say, oh, I have another governance meeting, I got some, I got some com conflicts, I can't make it. It's okay, because you're not one of the four, but we, as the four, owe it to the others who did not make it, an update to make sure that they're fully informed of what's going on. That's not excluding people from coming, absolutely not. It's, it's more of you four, dig up, put, roll up your sleeves, and really get into the understanding of this. Now, if somebody else wants to get in and understand his questions, you come to the meeting, by all means, absolutely. But we're looking to make sure that we're not burdening the whole board by going through this, and we're trying to get to the answers and trying to make sure we understand. Okay, I'll stop. I just, Go ahead. I think we should be burdened by it. I mean, that's part of why we were elected. That's, that's just I, my I totally see what you're saying, but I do think the, the one part that I do like about this is that when I do have finance questions, because I'm not a finance person, I always feel like I have to go to Mark and ask him questions. But if it was Mark and you and Phil and Lisa, like yeah. I could go to somebody, go to somebody else to ask my questions. So, so it would take a little bit, you know what I mean? Like there'd be four people that kind of dove into it a little bit more. Um, and I think that we would get like, you know, sometimes some people are better explaining things than others. That's, so, that's, that's the only thing I can, that to me would right. seem. But I think that could happen anyways, right? Like that's not, creating a committee doesn't I mean, exclude that. Like right now, if somebody felt like they wanted to call me up and have a big talk about finance, like I would, I would have a heart attack because I don't know how to do that. I don't know how you feel because I mean, I do read a lot of it and try to do it and I ask Mark, but I wouldn't be comfortable. But if I were on the committee, I would, I would have to be, I'd be accountable. I'd have to get the information. I would probably still call Mark a lot because and get all the information I needed from him. But like I would, I would feel like I needed to. Or now I, you know, right. that's that's and my that's my Mr. thought on it. Jeswick, right? Well, like, of course, yes, yes, right. yes. Yeah. So yes. any of us can. But yeah. the issue right. is this: but like, may, may I haven't had a chance to talk. Go yet. right. In. I feel <laughs> like this um, this recommendation gives us an opportunity to have some ownership over the stuff over the issues that come before us. I feel like right now, having served two years on the board, it's it's one of the things like we're just, okay, you're you're the lead on this, but we never really sit down and dig in. They're off and this is not a not not a critique by any means, but it often feels like we are being in the in our, for example, the academic achievement meetings, we're being given a presentation and we are left with just a very little bit of time to to debate and talk and dig into the issues. And I feel like switching the committee structure could give us an opportunity to really take ownership of, as a board of these issues, be more collaborative, talk about where the, where the problems are, help develop a strategy around it. And I'm not sure we have that opportunity to really have those discussions in the current format because it, it's like we all show up, no one really takes ownership, and then we're, we're always, and again, not a critique, but as a board, our, our job is to set policy and strategy. And if we're always on the receiving end, instead of you know rolling up our sleeves and getting involved, um, we 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 can't really engage in that role. Um, the other other thing I would like to point out is is 
is like Amy said, is some of us have strengths in certain areas where other, some of us don't and vice versa. Um, having the committee structure can help us use our talents more effectively um, to help move the, the district forward. So I see it as an opportunity to get more engaged and to really dig in and be better partners with the administration. So can you give me, so if we take the example of the academic achievement, because I'm having a heart, I'm having, I'm not able to um, think in my head of how this would be structured. Because to me, it's, we're just doing the same thing. So four people wanted to get involved in the governance, you could, right? There's nothing stopping necessarily. And that's where I'm getting confused. Like, would there be offline preparation in addition to, like, in person? That's where... I would say we'd have to prepare on our own. All that has to happen in the sunshine okay. here, but that we have our, for example, I'm going to say Mark and, I mean, I'm just throwing, it's not me who's on the finance committee. <laughs> Mark, Phil, Mike. I'm me. sorry, not looking Don't look at me. <laughs> um, Joe might be, because of their experience and, and especially their careers, might be logical additions to that because they come to it at a level where I'm not at with years of experience and education that I don't have in the finance area. They can really dig in, be partners with, with our professionals in, in digging in. We've got big issues in finance. And if we aren't going to roll up our sleeves, um, we aren't doing our jobs. And, and, not, and it's not an excuse that we shouldn't all do it. But um, I think this just empowers us more to take on those roles. Whereas right now, I'm not sure we all feel empowered to jump in and really, really take an active role in, in some of that strategy and, and big planning development. So can you take the February 27th? Sorry, I wanted to go back to this. Can you, um, can you on the February 27th, you said there was a lot of listening, which I agree, right? Because there was a, so much information for us to take in. Um, how taking the example of that meeting how would you how would you change that meeting in this committee structure so I can understand what that would look like how it would be different I think maybe we, we because let, let's assume that we all become the four the three or four become and I don't want to use the word experts but we become more knowledgeable in those areas because we are really really digging in so we can bypass maybe that history that background that time that we have to take and we can jump in and have the conversation and work with the administration so that we're not reacting for the first time to to the proposals today and I don't want to jump ahead but we could work together to develop the proposal to bring bring to the board at the meeting where the decisions are made or um, policy, that there might be policy changes that come out of those discussions, working together with the administration on the, so that we have a handful of board members who really know it inside and out, who can be a resource, who, who know how it's come together, who can help support the administration in moving these things forward. I think that's where it could be a benefit. Right now, we're just kind of receiving it, we get it, mm -hmm. we have to dig in, and sometimes for some of us, it's like, oh, this is the first time I'm seeing it. Whereas we could be talking about some of these big issues, whether it's a building project, whether it's the, the budget for the next year. Um, I, just, I just think it empowers us more to get more involved. So I guess the only, <clears throat> because it's in public would that be would that be hard if we cut out those presentations for the public to follow that would be my only concern of that structure they wouldn't they be would, they they could still come they wouldn't right? be they wouldn't no no be not that they couldn't come but would they be able to follow sure the, the, the presentations are made at the general planning session or um, when we go through that those presentations will be made okay you're 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 preparing yourself in the, at the board level, Th think about what we talked about in the workshop. Mark, it was 20,000, 30, 40,000, 30,000, 10,000, whatever, right? You know, not everybody can get down to the details, right? You can't get down there. You want to be at the more high level. We can't operate as a board at the high level across the board. We, we need some, fo some of the board members to dig in a little bit with your expertise, dig in a little bit, understand that, and then have the opportunity to communicate back. Mark did a good job the other day when he talked about the, um, uh, on the finance stuff. What was that thing you communicated? See, I already forgot because there's so much we have to <laughs> the learn. The capital projects. The capital uh, projects. And, and looking all, at the history. Right, absolutely. So, you know, he, he had the expertise, and we all were like, oh, geez, Mark, that was really good. That's the kind of thinking where we have the people who have a little bit more expertise in certain areas understand 
deal with it, set the agenda, work with the administration, then come back, and then in the general meeting, we share. They make a presentation. We share what we discovered, what the questions were. It makes it go smoother at that time as opposed to starting going, okay, first time I'm seeing this, what am I supposed to say? Right? We don't want to have that happen. That, so that's the idea of making this work. I think if I could use one word to try to describe the, the court. It's on. I just got to get closer. If I could use one word to describe, and Christina mentioned it, it's ownership. So as the finance, what, what do we call it, uh, what am I, uh, the finance lead of the board government, I feel an extreme sense of ownership to, to run that meeting and to also serve you, my colleagues on the board, to make sure there's a level of understanding, which is why uh, that's probably the best example of what, of what it would feel like if, if we had committee chairs who owned their subject and viewed their position as running these meetings, serving the board to make sure that, that the board had what it needed and understood it, and to synthesize very granular information to them uh, so that it's understandable. So what I did that one night with, again, it was a collaboration between me and Chris, but if you recall, I spoke quite a bit that night to help you guys understand. So that's an example of what it would, should feel like with ownership. Now, right now, that's the only subject I feel like I have ownership in. If I was on, if I was one of the four members of, I wouldn't be the chair, um, but let's say Joseph's uh, chair of the Buildings and Grounds, and I'm on Buildings and Grounds, which I've been on. I'm also going to, because I'm a member of that subcommittee, I'm going to feel more ownership because I'm on it. And that's the difference. And it doesn't change anything else. Everyone else could attend. If you want to attend every meeting, you could attend every meeting. And the other benefit that's different today that we didn't have in 2018 was every meeting streamed. Uh, you can get a, you can attend virtually, which makes it easier, and every meeting's recorded, which wasn't always the truth. So we have that to our advantage too. Okay. So what I, what I'm hearing is maybe less presentation, more engagement, as far as your point, Christina. Yes. Yeah, but I do think yeah. there's a level of presentation that needs to happen mm -hmm. to bring other board members in the community up to speed at the regular voting right, meeting. Right, regular. But, but yeah, I think there's just more opportunity if we have we have board members who are who I, I just think it gives you a I keep saying it more ownership when you are assigned to a committee and you're sitting down and you're really working through issues that then come to the board and then we're just not always receiving but we're actually a part of it. Okay, thank you. Um, I still stand by my opinion that we should all participate, at least in finance, but I do see what you're saying, and I think that there are ways that we can move forward constructively to make that happen. Good. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Mark, we want to go for here on the finance thing. What would you like to do? Well, I tell you what. Um, we have our next finance governance meeting on May 6th. So um, I think for that one, we'll prepare that one just like we did the last one, I think we should let everyone think about this discussion. If we want to do something formal, let's plan for that. At the next April, at the yeah. April meeting. Yeah, there's no, there's no, this isn't like urgent need right. to do, but we should, we should plan for it if, uh, give it time to marinate and have everyone uh, reflect on it. And if we wanted to change policy, we have to do three reads and all, right? Correct? If we wanted to correct. switch. Okay, just, okay. Okay, all right, thank, thank you, Mark. Okay, my pleasure. All right, um, and you did already do 4.07. I think I, you just said that, didn't you? I did. I, yeah, snuck I, in you, there. I saw how you snuck that in. That was slick. <laughs> okay. All right. Moving on to buildings and ground item 5.01, um, Joe. 5.01 is an action item motion to approve the attached proposals for professional services from Tower Engineering to provide schematic design, bidding documents, and construction administration for full HVAC system replacement at Wixford Elementary and Richland Elementary Schools. Second. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thank you. Yeah. All right. We have a motion. Uh, it's been seconded. Uh, any discussion? No discussion. All right. So the engi uh, the point uh, the engineering firm is um, Tower Tower Engineering. Mm -hmm. That's right? correct. Okay. Yeah. So they're doing it. So um, so are they the same firm that? did the engineering for the other construction we've done inside the school at the, the gym uh, green gym and also the main gym and so forth that's correct 
So they've also done middle um, school HVAC, mm -hmm. the HVAC assessments for all the schools. Yeah, yeah. They've done the green, the green gym, main gym, anything that's um, the MEP, the mechanical, electrical, plumbing. They do all of that engineering for us. Okay, you comfortable with you know? I mean, they've from what I'm hearing from the community, there's been some mistakes made. And I want to make sure that we're comfortable moving forward with these guys because, boy, when we start going up on the roof and doing things, right. we certainly don't want to be missing stuff. Sure, absolutely. And I, I don't want to overemphasize mistakes made on projects. Whenever you go into a large construction project, multi-million dollar project, there's always a contingency that you should hold about 5%. We're nowhere near 5% on any change orders for the last five years that I've been here. We're averaging around 2%, actually. So. They're doing a really good job for us. I know every change order feels like a big mistake, but there are so many things to think about, especially when you're not doing new construction, you're doing retrofits in an older building. Yeah. There are just so many things that can pop up. No, I fully understand from a yeah. project standpoint, there's always good to have a contingency 100% behind awesome. you because it's not so much mistakes. It's like, yeah, we didn't you know, think of this or this didn't happen. Um, the, 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 the information that I had heard about from multiple sources was, you know, like the, the bleachers in, in, in the gym, the main gym. I mean, they don't come all the way out. The, so and there's... Maybe I don't understand it. It's a know. different firm, different design issue. And that's, that's not... What you said is not accurate. We can fix that at a different yeah. time. But what I would say is this. Tower has done excellent work for the district. Okay. They are highly regarded. And um, we 100% believe they should be the firm supporting us. Joe has history and background knowledge with them as well. Okay. Yeah. Good. So that, that, that's what I needed. So I can, that's, I can that's answer the, the question regarding bleachers that it, and yeah. through a weekly update. That's a different matter, and that's in order to hit our target capacity in the gym, which we knew all along. Okay. All right. Yeah. But no, these comments are very good, so thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, and that was more of an architectural miss than engineering. Our engineering team has been pretty spot on. Okay. All right. That, thank you. Yeah. Very helpful. Very helpful. Okay. So um, any other discussion? Okay, so um, we have a motion that's been seconded. Um, discussion's over. All those in favor? Yes. 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 All those opposed? Okay, motion passes. Thank you. 5.02 is an action item motion to approve Eccles Construction Services to provide professional construction management services for the Wexford and Richland Elementary Schools HVAC installation projects described in attached fee proposal. Second. We have a motion that's been made and seconded. Uh, any discussion on this one? Okay, all in favor? Yes. 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 All opposed? Okay, motion passes. 5.03 is an action item. It's a motion to approve improvements to the Richmond Elementary baseball and softball fields by sports turf specialties for a total cost of $9,800. Second. Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Um, any discussion on this one? No, okay. Um, all in favor? Yes. 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 All opposed? Okay, motion passes. 5.04 is an action item. It's a motion to approve the 2024 baseball and softball maintenance proposal from Sports Turf Specialties, Inc. for a total cost of $13,615. Second. Okay, motion's been made and second. Any discussion on this item? Okay, all in favor? Yes. 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 All opposed? Okay, motion passes. 5.05 is an action item. It's a motion to approve the purchase of a new three-quarter ton pickup truck for the facilities department from C. Harper Commercial Truck Center, CoStars 025E23579, in the amount of $59,385. Second. Okay, motions have made and seconded. Any comments? I do, actually. Yeah. Mr. Zimmerman, yeah. excuse me, Mr. Zimmerman, would you mind explaining again um, uh, the need for the truck and, and how you came to that decision? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So. Right now, um, we only have one vehicle that's capable of towing our equipment trailer, and the equipment trailer can take our, um, our lift around and also our, uh, our construction equipment that we have, our skid steer loader. Um, right now, that's a dump truck that's um, the year group 2011, so that's also the truck that we use to plow and salt. It's starting to get some rust damage. It's an older vehicle. This new vehicle will allow us to, to have um, a secondary vehicle to tow that around without taking off the salt equipment in order so that it'll fit on the back of the truck. So this will give us some, some flexibility. Also, it gives us some, um, some future um, capabilities as well. So right now, the rest of our fleet is aging as well. We have, a, we have three um, Ford vans that are 2000 
in 11 through 2013 year group, and they're starting to get older. So looking forward, we shouldn't need to buy such big vans for our maintenance team. We can go with something smaller, more economical, more fuel efficient, like a transit van that you see driving around now. So this kind of gives us our, our one big vehicle that can pull all of our heavy equipment and lets us kind of scale back in the future. Other comments? Um, I had another question. Yeah, go right ahead. Was this something that was built into your plan? I'm sure it probably was, but I'm still new. So it is. Yeah. So actually we had this truck budgeted in the 2022-23 year group. But you know, like right after COVID hit, uh, trucks were hard to find. Everything was going at like 15 grand over MSRP. This vehicle right here is a $75,000 truck that we're getting for $59,000. So with the CoStar's um, discount of 11,000 plus C Harper gave us another $4,000 off. Um, I mean, it's, it's a good deal for us. Okay, and our other comments? Um, I, I know my, my, my feeling is um, right now we're, we're in the midst of contract negotiations um, for bargaining agreement. And I understand when we have maintenance, we got to do things, we got to make, we got to spend the money. I'm just a little concerned to, to take a big chunk like this this year and to do this as opposed to later. That would be my view until we can get through those negotiations and get them behind us and we take care of the teachers and understand. That would be my view here on this one. Other comments? Yeah, I, I would say from an operational efficiency standpoint, Mr. Zimmerman's team, there are certain necessities to operate a $101 million budget or whatever we have. I mean, we got a lot of buildings. We've got a lot of maintenance. We have a lot of grounds. We have a lot of things that happen on a daily basis. They do an incredible job of stretching dollars and vehicles and maintaining them. Uh, from my perspective as superintendent, this is a very small cost. This is part of what it means to operate a district like we have. So, you know, the fact that we're able to negotiate below CoStars, CoStars is already the, the state joint cooperative purchasing price. So we're already getting what is in essence the best price. Just like Mr. Stobener does with technology, Mr. Zimmerman has negotiated below CoStars. This is a great deal. We need to operate. This is, from my view, a pretty small uh, expenditure. And I would just add too, this is budgeted. And so we budgeted it at a higher number, and our actual expense is lower than our budget. So I feel very differently about something like this uh, than I do like the scoreboard, which is something that's not yet in a budget. So it's just a very different decision. And I think on maintenance issues like this, um, we're being very prudent. Um, it's been planned for, budgeted for, and now we got our best price. So it seems to be, it seems to be uh, fair. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other points? What color will it be? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a it's dark gray and it's also a Ram truck, so. Oh, good. <laughs> All right, any, any other comments, discussions? <laughs> All right, motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Yes. yes. All opposed? Yeah, nay. Okay. Stand by my principle. Okay, thank you. Motion passes. All right. 5.06 is an information item for board consideration at the April planning meeting, motion to approve installation and repair of fencing at the high school stadium and baseball field backstop by RNS fence and railing supply in amount to be determined. Okay. 5.07 is an information item that Mr. Zimmerman and Mr. Gerondo will provide to the board at this time. All right, so I wanted to discuss the, the scoreboard tonight. So as you see, it's listed as an information item again. So at the last board meeting, uh, we talked about it being as an information item with a recommendation. Um, following that meeting, we got some updated uh, cost information and the cost actually went up. So some of our vendors started adding some contingency money for, for unforeseen things, such as um, hitting rock, the bedrock layer or additional electrical. We went back to them, um, let them know that um, the cost increases uh, were not acceptable and we would go back to the board and we, we weren't gonna present something to the board that I didn't feel comfortable with, Mr. Geronda didn't feel comfortable with. We shared it with the rest of our planning team and we decided that we would put this back on as an information item. And we put a, a small slide deck together just to show you where we're at 
and, um, and the reasoning for us to, to put this back as information. And what the timing is, we think the, a better schedule for timing is going to look like to get us the best um, scoreboard and the best price for our community. Uh, that, that timeline is actually on the last slide where we'll present um, our final recommendation on April 8th. But leading up until then, we're going to have two board updates that we're going to provide during the Friday update on we were, where we stand for the price and uh, the two competing um, competitors that we have and our signed competitors. Um, as we proposed to you last board meeting, we thought we, we would be in that the low 500s for a scoreboard. Um, as of right now, we got some more information back. We think that we're going to maintain that same, that same cost range in the low 500s. Um, and actually went down about $15,000. So we are getting some more favorable um, quotes through because we've, we've opened it up to more electrical vendors. So originally, um, like Dr. Miller mentioned, we, we're using a co-stars process. So in spending public funds, we use a bidding process or we can use a cooperative purchasing process. Cooperative purchasing gives us more flexibility to pick vendors that we like to deal with or who are specialty vendors, such as sign vendors. But under their umbrella of their co-stars contract, they can use whoever they want to, make the pro to execute the project. So they were using their own electricians and their own um, excavation companies. So we've gone back and we've challenged them to use three electrical vendors so that we get, because that seems like it's the most expensive trade other than the board itself is electricity. So, so far we've got two of the three vendors that have supplied, the electrical vendors have supplied quotes back. The number's actually gone down a little bit, like I mentioned. And we think by the time we get the third vendor in, we'll have a really good uh, competitive process there. That's not a bid process. It's a co-stars cooperative purchasing process. So it still gives us the flexibility to, to make the selection on what we think is the best value. Um, so some other things I wanted to talk about since our last meeting is we have reached out to our, our band directors and, and talked to them on how the scoreboard will affect the experience of the band students during the game. So a lot of us were thinking on the operations side, like where people sit and will be able to view the board, and those weren't even the most important aspects to the band directors. There's, their biggest concern is how does it degrade the experience of the students in the band um, color guard and the cheer team. So what we don't want to do is drown out all of our great atmosphere at the game by providing commercials. So we, we, if we do go ahead with the board, we have to determine what we're going to do for our advertising base, what we're going to do for our, uh, how we're going to play the, the music and, and ads and hype videos and not drown out the band. So the band still needs to play their own hype you know, songs. They need to play all their fight songs. So we need to make sure that we're thinking of that. And we also need to make sure that we don't cut down on the halftime show length for those band members as well. That's very important for the whole atmosphere of the game. <coughs> um, leading into that, we, we talked about um, as a revenue generating device to kind of offset the cost. We know that this is an expensive purchase. We know that there are other things that we're spending in the district that are very expensive. If, if you looked at this project as a net present value project with all, the, with all of the opportunities in advertising, this, this scoreboard could pay for itself in five to six years if we do a nice program. Just comparing what the scoreboard, a similar scoreboard at Cumberland Valley, they're making $120,000 a year in revenue. Right now, we're making $16,000 a year in revenue. So even if we did somewhere in the middle with, with being respectful, with being tasteful, we could pay for the scoreboard without it really affecting the community. We could, we could use it as its own, it could pay for itself. So uh, I just wanted to bring those points up because this project is just not a scoreboard like, like buying a pickup truck. This, this is a, at the time, I didn't realize how difficult this process was going to be. That's why it's kind of dragged on a little bit longer, and that's why it's still information. There's so many things to think about, and they all tie together to make it a worthwhile project. So that's why we would like to uh, follow the schedule on the timeline, provide those updates to you, and, and then do our final approval on April 8th. 
both of the sign vendors said the April 8th decision gives them the window that they need to execute the project in the fall and be done in the fall. So originally we thought we'd be a little tight. They verified with us this week that they will be able to make that deadline with our April 8th decision. Hey, so Sean, I can you go to slide two oh. real quick. I just think it's, it's worth, you know, again, a little bit of a reminder when we look at projects like this, what, what are we thinking about? And, and we're thinking about the flexibility of, of the resource. So if you've been in our main gym now, we have a digital board and it's serving so much more of a purpose beyond just telling what the score of the game is. Um, we're using it for um, assemblies when we have our entire student body in there and celebrating some different academic things that are happening in there. So again, we think about things like we have our senior awards now that happens at our stadium and how can we use the board to enhance that experience for our kids and families. Same thing with you know, any other activities that we have there. Obviously graduation happens at our stadium. Um, our band events happen. So there's, there's a way to enhance that experience through a digital board that also gives us the flexibility. I mean, you see football as an example, but the flexibility around any sport that is using the stadium as part of this design that we think is appropriate too. We always think about, you know, we want people gathering there to see our students perform. That's the main goal. It's not a distraction. It's not meant to be that with all the, you know, bells and whistles of advertising, but that's a piece of of what it can offer as well. So that went into it. And if you go to the, to the next slide, that's kind of the base. And then from these companies determining what's the most appropriate location for where this would be installed, that's what um, Jeff's talking about in those considerations there as well. And we talked about that as well. So we tried to break this down so you'd see the base cost, some alternatives that we think would be appropriate and then the final cost. And because of the electric, that's prolonged this a little bit and we want to come forward with a good um, recommendation. Mr. Zimmerman, you yeah. came up with some really interesting comments about the other school districts and how they're trying to get paid for it and you threw out some numbers. Um, it would be very important to have those in, in the update. You know, Absolutely, that's why. Because <clears throat> that's the first time we've actually heard that, so thank you for going and researching that. That's kind of the information that was helpful, so yeah. thank you. Yeah, well, so I, I would just say, though, going forward, I, I'm very interested in that because yeah. when I look ahead at some of the financial challenges that are on the horizon, half a million dollars for a scoreboard seems like a, it's a, a what a want to, not a have to. Um, and so I'm, I would be very interested in knowing how this pays for itself over right. you know a relatively short period of time. Otherwise, I just think we have greater priorities on the scoreboard. Is and correct me if I'm wrong, but this the one we have works right. It's still mm -hmm. not still really. It does. It, it, it keeps score. It it does, it does yeah. Not always. Not but, always. No. So what I would, I want to caution everybody on something. I don't want to date myself, <laughs> but in 20 plus years of experience in the industry, capital projects never get cheaper. So if you kick the can down the road, it's not going to be cheaper. It's going to be more expensive. We're getting the price right now at 2021's rates. It's 2022 rate, the same 2022 rate rates. Valley. Not 2024's rates. If we kick the can down the road three years, we're not gonna get 2022 rates. We're gonna get 2027's rates. Okay. So it's, gonna, it's not gonna be 500,000 anymore. It's gonna be a million dollars now. So I'm really interested in what the revenue generation is to offset it. That, I'm just that, saying, yeah. sooner or later, that new school board is gonna be needed. So if you think you're saving the district money now by kicking the can down the road, you're actually probably going to cost the, the district more. So just another data point. Uh, so 20 years ago, this very conversation was had. Dactronics, one of the two vendors, was going to gift us a scoreboard. They were going to give it to us in exchange for controlling the advertising on it and our board I wasn't part of that board but I remember it vividly and that board voted it down nine nothing as soon as we did South Fayette got it um, so it, it but for me it, it raises another question and maybe no one else cares about it I care about it and it's the appropriateness of commercializing high school athletics at that level which I think we should, if we're going to go that route, if we're going to justify this expense with a revenue stream 
of advertising, then I'd like to have a conversation about the appropriateness of that. So I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely fair. Like, I went and looked at the scoreboard in Altoona last week and asked them how that they fund it. They only have one major sponsor there, and it's Sheets. And Sheets does not dominate the airtime or the commercial time. They let the school kind of choose. But it's really based on what the advertiser a is asking for. Yeah. And that would be all based on what you would. Yeah. So I don't want to lose sight of that. If we're, gonna, right. if we're, gonna, if we're going to uh, have that enter the conversation, then I think we need to look at that. Yeah. And if you go to that advertising slide, Sean, I mean, that is yeah, something that, policy. that Mr. Geronda yeah. is doing a little bit behind the scenes still, too, that we'll bring forward as he finds more information out from those that are interested in doing something more significant. And that's definitely, based upon our policy, needs to be brought forward in front of the board to have that conversation. It would be some type of naming rights or something. Okay. You mentioned um, $16,000 right now that we take in. Yeah. Who, who's who sponsors it currently? Yeah, so we currently have four sponsors on okay. the on the board, but Ms. Hasinger might be able to respond. I think it's on the screen. I think it's uh, STA. And it's on the, yeah. yeah. It's okay, yeah. it's right there. Okay. <coughs> they have little squares. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Is the Beowulf Club, Beowulf it, Book Club? Beowulf is there as well. It's yes. not. Uh, Dr. P started that, but he couldn't finish it. Uh, uh, <laughs> Mr. Stobener, can you click on 913.1? That was to make sure our English teachers are still awake back there. <laughs> so I guess there is a, this policy is worth a read now. So if this yeah. is a conversation the board wants to have, 913.1 is a policy that has to be read. So there is advertising to which we have certain criteria by which we must approve or consider that. And only very few criteria that would keep an advertiser from advertising. I mean, that's the reality of it. There are very specific things, you know, listed here. Uh, so there's the exclusive rights is a totally different conversation than one that we have not had, and that is the board's purview totally. But so depending on the level of consideration from a company or business, you know, as we talked earlier about joint governance or finance committee, no matter what you call it, um, if that's where this policy is living or buildings and grounds, I don't, it, I don't know where it fits best. The time to schedule the next meeting to talk about that mm -hmm. is that's soon. That's a great point, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, in the meantime, the I think just reading it, we do have a lot of information on our website as well, but the policy itself is worth a review. So the advertisements that you're thinking of now, are they more like a live commercial and not the like placards or the, the fixed signs or a combination or? If you go back to that advertising okay. slide, and that, an example of what, no, the other, the advertising. So more of like a slide. Yeah, something like, like what you, see, oh, like the advertising one. I think that one. It's fine. There it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the bottom right is a little bit of something that, you know, that we were using in the green gym. Um, we're not doing commercials. We don't see that again. It's taken away from the focus on the students, but having some level of that pop up at different breaks and whatnot seems appropriate. Yeah. So the scoreboard is capable of showing the score and then changing every, like 30 seconds and putting ads down just the banner on the side and leaving the score. Or whenever we put a, okay, like like a like replay that. or something up, there could, there could be a template like that we make that shows. So, mm -hmm. so like it, it could be fixed. Oh, right. Just like yeah. those, are, those are digital. So they're, they're still right. digital. They're, yeah. not, they're not permanent. But they're yet. not like a moving like dancing popcorn or something like that. <laughs> we can you know, like we can, we, you know what I mean? Right. You could do that. No, I'm just kidding. You could do that. We're not having the it might help the uh, concession right, so stance. There, there, there's consideration. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I appreciate all the information, yeah. and I especially appreciate the the looking into it and getting tasteful thoughts. Of, you know, like you know, we want advertising, but we don't want anything crazy. So I appreciate that word that you used. That's good. One last question. Yeah, go ahead. So I want to be clear. So the scoreboard is or is not working right now. So I'm hearing yes, but then I'm hearing no. So it works. So, yeah, the scoreboard is functional for uh, displaying digits. Um, the message board hasn't been functional for seven or eight years, um, so it's just a, a an abandoned part of the scoreboard, right. which kind of makes it look worse. But um, we could operate the scoreboard the way that we're doing now um, into the future with some repairs, but it, it's at its end of life. 
Dr. Miller has agreed to change the score by hand if necessary. I mean, okay. it, it has gone out at some games. Flip chart. Yeah. What is the flip chart? <laughs> Noted. We'll, we'll remember that. It's in the minutes. So I just want to say one thing before we close out or on, on my side is that this, the slides that we presented there that Dr. P went through that I did not kind of shows you how transparent we're being about the whole process. We're going to fill in all of these columns so that you can, in all the boxes, so that you can actually see the prices we're getting. And then we're going to have to work together on the advertising part. But that's what's making this so difficult. And I don't want anyone to feel that, you know, I promised you last time that I was going to be ready for you guys to vote tonight. We're obviously not there. I hope that that doesn't affect the trust level that we're doing the right things. So no, you've, you've done very well because you listen to the questions and the comments. You've come back with a lot of information. Fully understand how you're digging in. Do you need more? Perfect. It, that's okay. But I think we've learned a lot more today. I mean, and Absolutely. I think you continue to bring that data. And I understand from an advertising standpoint, we've got some decisions to make. But it's not like you're going to come with an advertising per here, here, here's what we can we can do. I know that takes we take some work, but here's some examples of what other schools have done, and how they've shown their scoreboard with it. That's the kind of thing that I didn't know you had, and that's very helpful to me. Okay. So, so guys, just that was a Go good conversation. <laughs> Darn near everybody said something. That's good. And Jeff, thank you for your transparency and, and just honesty with this too. And, and don't feel bad if you got to keep going slow. Honestly, yeah. what I'm concerned about is this timeline. It's still pretty aggressive for April 8th of board approval. So um, give yourself some more grace and slow it down. I just, I want to support it. I just, I'm just asking myself, can we just get one more year? One more year would even be a big help to me. So, okay. um, so that, that's all, last, but thank you. Okay, all right, Joe. 5.08 is an information item for board consideration at the April planning meeting. Motion to approve the repair of three structural columns located in the high school natatorium by Jeffrey Edward Measel, architect, in an amount of not to exceed 12,600. Second. It's a mo no, it's an information. Oh, it's a, I'm sorry. Yeah. Item 5.09 is an information item for board consideration at the April planning meeting. Motion to approve the replacement of the storage room double doors on the pool deck by A.G. Morrow, an amount to be determined. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Joe. All right, Christina, academic achievement. Item 6.01 is a discussion item uh, regarding curriculum. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Pasquinelli. He'll turn it back to me. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, <laughs> Obviously a critical topic. So we met on February 27th. The board was present and participated. We have a number of members of our staff administration uh, here. And we took action based upon the board's feedback. So February 27th was not a long time ago. But based on the conversation from the board, there was a sense of purpose and urgency in wanting to take the next steps. There was also, Mr. Morset had some consensus from the board about the desired level of sort of board engagement under the topic of curriculum. So this slide was one that was shown in the last um, meeting. So it's, it's attached to the February 27th, and it may be, a, I don't even know if we reattach it here, but it's attached there. So what we've done is put together the curriculum plan. So there were three policies where Ms. Brussels had identified we did not have a green check. Okay, and so those policies you see in this for board consideration at April 8th, motion to approve the curriculum plan, that's policy 105, so that's one green check. Revised level of curriculum for board adoption, we have a proposal tonight that hits the gap of what the board gave us to think about, that's policy 106. And then a district level resource definition for listing with revised level of curriculum for board adoption, policy 109. So all six policies were reviewed and considered in developing what we consider to be a relatively concise overview of curriculum plans. So we heard the words that were important to the board, development, approval, modification, and adherence. And so what this 
plan does, and you can see it, for something as complex as curriculum and six policies, this gets it as about as concise as possible in terms of what we, what we as the subject matter leads think about in terms of what is the right level based upon what the board told us. So we're listening. So these words reflect what you said in a way that can be operational for the school district. So a ton of work has been done in the last decade. We're not going to go back through that. But ultimately, we have this question in front of our schools about what exactly is the level of curriculum for approval, then what's included with that that, that is visible and aware? How do we stay aligned to that? When or how does the board stay engaged in any changes or modifications that have occurred? And then where does that fit? So as the board knows, the program of studies process occurs typically in January, so it starts in the fall. But by January, the board approves that, and then we go right into course requests, scheduling, staffing, all of the other things that happen during the course of the school year. What we're proposing in this plan is that we would bring to the board, likely in the time frame of May, the curriculum written at the level for board approval that would also become the public replace the public facing curriculum which is currently out there for parents or anybody else that wants to look that level of detail would be there we would bring that forward for the board to review and consider in may june of this year so we're talking about in the next two and a half months or so that's for over 300 courses organized by department so that is that is what we're recommending year over year then what we've included in here is that we would you know, year to year, some courses, no change. Some courses might have very minor changes. Some courses might have more major uh, or significant changes. They would all come back in front of the board, but your attention most likely would be focused on minor and major changes so that you could narrow what it is that you're looking at year over year with the confidence the other things are, are, are static. So that's the general concept that's in here. We discussed at length and heard a lot of input about resources. So we've identified here what are some of those district level resources. Those are resources like a textbook or certain programming, computer software or online uh, applications that are used across every grade level or that particular content area. Those are commonly utilized. Those are district level. Teachers are always going to, I mean, this is the reality, they're always going to find uh, other resources that support. Now they have to make thoughtful decisions about those other resources. They should be planned. There should, they should, teachers sh should exercise good judgment as they attempt to do now. We've addressed even that with criteria in the plan tied back to the policies that exist. So again, relatively concise summary, but it hits all six of those policies. The three that the board felt comfortable with and the, th the three that the board thought there needed to be a greater level of connection and oversight. So what we're recommending is that we talk through that, questions, clarifications, but we're asking for board action on the curriculum plan that ties these six policies together in a way that allows the board to feel comfortable with their school code responsibilities and oversight, but also functions a way that's manageable for implementation across 335 teachers and, and everything else that we have uh, going on in the district. So in order to uh, show that in a practical sense and not because we're here to dive into ninth grade English so this ninth grade English was selected based on the dialogue but it's not here tonight for the purposes of ninth grade English debate we even have English teachers here but it's not That's for it. ninth grade English conversation the purpose is to show yeah leave that slide real whoever had that up so what we attempted to do was find a little bit of a sweet spot between the middle, which is what the parents, what's currently online, and the right, which is the unit-based curriculum that was designed to develop for teachers, used by teachers. So we've tried to hit a spot in between those, and we're gonna talk through what we developed, and we appreciate, we engaged our sixth grade English teachers, sixth grade, ninth grade English teachers, in sort of working through that. So again, February 27th is not a long time ago. We've done a ton of work to try to listen to the feedback of the board, embed that in the curriculum plan, and then be able to show a prototype. So you okay if I keep going? 
Sure. All right. Yeah. So, you can so ex again, we're, we're finding that spot between what is middle and what is on the right. And that's what the board said. And I, again, Mr. Morissette was very clear in trying to query the level of um, weeds. Was it weeds? Weeds is fine. Finding the, yeah, that right level. understand what that word means. So what we have here, again, prototype. So we see the course name. We see the department, grade level how long it meets and how often it meets. So in this case, it's a full year, full-time course at the ninth grade level. The course overview was re revised. So it, it does a, in a paragraph, it's capturing the major um, learning goals, what students should know and be able to do. It ties in language relevant for that particular subject area. So we see that. Then we've identified again, what we're calling primary resources. So these are the board, these are the district level resources, textbooks that are board approved or anthologies, in this case, a text that has all sorts of different types of stories and text, uh, poems, et cetera. We see that there are collections. And then because in some of our departments, there isn't a textbook or there's a textbook, but there's not other resources like this. In this case, we know core text has been a big part of the discussion. And we added a little bit of detail here so that we see that some of these texts are novels. One is a poem, an epic poem, uh, and then we also have a drama. So we have a little bit more clarity around that. In the units, which is currently there, we've, we've expanded that to embed just a little bit more detail. We've also put the approximate number of days. So parents or the board can see that in a full year, full time course, these are the major units of study. These are the major resources that to support that unit of study. And then what we had to ask the teachers to do was select a sample, not all, because then we get, that, that gets to the depth that is overwhelming but a sample of the learning goals because the learning goals are those things which most clearly help us understand when we're using To Kill a Mockingbird, we're using To Kill a Mockingbird as sort of a vehicle to teach things like citing strong and thorough textual evidence, determining a theme or central idea. So these learning goals are really what helps, I think, a parent and the board understand what's happening in that course. So we have the dates and times. If you could scroll um, to okay. the next. Keep going. So that keeps going all the way through the units that are in that course. Now, this is an interesting part in this example. That's correct. You don't prepare for the keystone just in the week leading up to the keystone. It's embedded throughout. And so they've mm -hmm. captured that idea that these days are embedded within the lesson design and unit delivery that happens over the course of time. It's not like a, um, a boot camp per se, but more uh, embedded in what's happening in the classroom. Then we see the forms or types of assessment that are used in that particular course, whether standardized assessments are utilized. Some will, again, some courses will not have that. And then in this particular case, we see a hyperlink directly to the Pennsylvania Academic Standards. So again, we've taken um, Mr. Stobener, if you could go back to that slide where it had the three things on it. Yeah. So what was created in that prototype lives between what was in the middle. It's much more detailed than what was in the middle, but not as detailed as what lives on the right. When the board feels comfortable with the prototype and we're not comfortable moving forward, until the board feels comfortable with the prototype right. because we are talking a massive engagement of our staff they have to have very clear expectations for format and and all the it's not so much the work that that we're going to be able to i think crank out fairly quickly because we have all the information it's just putting it together but the format of the actual written curriculum that we're talking about at this level that's going to be critical so our hope is that when the board's ready as soon as the board's ready we're ready so when you're ready we're ready Curriculum plan would be an approval once it's discussed and, and understood and, and tweaked or whatever. And then the actual prototypes would be developed for over 300 courses across the district. Can I ask a question? Of course. So I'm looking at this and I think I misunderstood initially when I read it on my own before coming to the meeting and now hearing uh, Dr. Miller's description. Sample 
doesn't mean these are changeable. This is just a sampling of like the goals, where it says sample learning Yeah, goals. so there might be six or eight major learning goals within a unit. These are the these most are important. These are three of the, those, those show the, yes, they're, they're very important. They're all important. Can I yeah. suggest a change of title here? Instead of sample learning goals, major learning goals? or something like that because when I first read it I was like wait a second I don't want sample learning goals I want I want this to be definitive in a way so that people understand that it's not something that's yeah, they are that's learning goals taken directly from that unit of study right but, but I misunderstood it they're, so if they're the, all major so okay. they're not in the unit based curriculum if they're not major so, so how, picking another word like selected learning goals or again you, you come up with the phraseology but they're not they're not more important than the other learning goals. They just show a reflection of what happens within the course. So are they showing, are they these three, for example, in unit one, were they the best ones to demonstrate the course? They attempted to select those that would provide the okay. clearest picture of what happens in day-to-day -day instruction within that unit. Okay. Who also but again, there's a lot of stuff in it. Some overlap in learning goals and units of study as well, yeah. too. So to get some different examples of learning goals is part of this as well. That would be my one one suggestion because when I read it I was like, oh wait a second, I don't want to sample, I want to I want to know what's in this course, I want to understand but if, it. I think if you go at the bottom and you click the standards, don't they they would all come up correct. So you would no, see all the it's not the learning goals. Well you would you could go to grade nine. Yeah, like you the would, learning it would take goals you to aren't the yeah. standards. Okay. But gotcha. they completely align to them. Yeah. That's why they're there. So you would have that information as well, like the Pennsylvania standards. Yeah, so but well. I, I do think we. She's, I think she's hung up on the word sample. Sample. Yeah. Like so if, if you it, can think of another yeah. word, because well, that might be. Do we have any English teachers in the <laughs> audience? We do. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Very representative. Yeah. They were representative. Yeah. Yeah. Learning goals. Yeah, that's good. And I would just want, and thank you, I would just want when someone opens it up that they understand what those are, what's in the course, that we're understanding that this is this is the best way to describe what's in the course, that we're not leaving things out or that this is up for, that learning goals in one class could be different than learning goals in another class. And when I read it initially, it was like, okay, here's a sample, teachers can choose what the learning goals are. And so I, I don't want there to be confusion around what that word means to this document. What about like embedded, yeah. embedded I, learning goals? I like goals. the word representative. How do you feel about representative? I don't dislike it. I, I, I yeah. haven't really thought about it, but I just, I when I read that sample, I was like, I, I completely misunderstood it initially. It's not a menu, it's happening, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly, back to the whole core text discussion that we had, um, how, how, I know this is an example and we're not debating what's in this example, but like for example, unit one, are these the books that are being read, go, all of those, go back or to is that, that a menu again? to unit one, no. So the way this was written is these text, unit one, To Kill a Mockingbird, separate piece, um, or, or A Tale of t mm -hmm. Two Cities would be integrated into that unit of studies by all teachers that teach English nine. So there's an or in there. There's a choice between those two S text. Two of those texts will be integrated? There's. To, to Kill a Mockingbird is one everyone would be using, and then there's the choice between Separate Peace and A Tale of Two Cities. Okay. When I see that, uh -huh. I read that as there's a choice between those three. So that, that, so I think we have to think about how yeah. can we be more clear Understood. on what we're trying to communicate as what is like the required or core text across this class, across the grade level, and what are resources that teachers can choose to where the where the choices and what is required i yes. guess more clarity on that that's so the one go ahead keep okay, going that's all that was all my right. other comment so i think re continuing to look at that curriculum plan and see how it tr attempts to address each of the pieces i think will be important there are discussions to be had and so again some courses will not have um they obviously they won't have core text some courses will not have textbooks. I say that to say, when we have a prototype that, we, that the board approves, 
there are going to, no matter how well we build a prototype, there are going to be department by department nuances within the prototype. If we attempt to be perfect, it won't, it won't meet the needs of the staff or the content area. But if, we're, if we have a good frame that's flexible enough to handle the different areas, then the board's still going to see them all, even if the, the frame is slightly adjusted. So you, the point on core text is well heard and understood. Well heard and understood. Okay. I just want to make sure but that people understand, parents understand, we're all on the same page. Yeah, and there, and there needs to be conversation. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about things like academic joint achievement meetings, joint governance, yes. committee, whatever, I mean, no, none of that makes any difference to me. We're doing the same things here regardless of how the seats are arranged. So it's the same, same work for us. If the board wants to have an in-depth conversation in some of those departments, we're going to need to schedule and hold that. So if we really want to understand core text, for example, and core text are all not novels, and, and teachers of English 9, when you see the types of the genre study they're doing, when you see the types of, of literature and text they're choosing, they're not doing, they're not pounding novel after novel after poem after, I mean, you can't do that. That's not the way the class operates. And so there's just, there are decisions that are being made and they're going to need to understand where they have latitude and where they don't. And we're going to need to talk about that. And once we talk about that and hopefully engage those, in this example, English teachers, engage them in discussion. And I hope that the board is open to hearing from them. Like, what, what are they thinking about? When they approach a novel with a class or select from a list, what is it that informs their thinking? That's a good academic meeting in English at the secondary level. We have 300 plus courses across K through 12. So we're talking about significant amount of information and discussion. So I just, I say that again, only to make sure we're ready because we will be ready to bring it forward but we've got a lot coming within whatever prototype the board you know, f feels comfortable with. And then the only other, and then I'll stop, is um, maybe it's with learning goals, learning goals and topics. Maybe English isn't the best example, but I'm thinking like, you know, history, that you're going to cover these, these topics. In the, just giving a broad overview of in each unit these things are going to be discussed so that there aren't questions about how things fit in or what your kid's going to be learning and, and so that just parents can be more engaged in that process. I, I would go back to the, can you go back to the curriculum plan? So uh, part of what I think you're getting at, and I don't want to mix up the prototype with everything that goes into the course. So, I mean, the reality is, unless it's everything, which is not so, so here, if you could, just here's what I'm, I'm looking at. So as you work through the plan, we get to adherence. So the paragraph, uh, sorry, Mr. Stobin, or not that one, the, the actual board docs. And it, it starts with adherence, which was a word we used several mm -hmm. times in the last yeah. meeting. It's just it's scroll up a bit. Yeah, it's like the third or fourth And if you paragraph. could, uh, you've got a happy scroll yeah, button yeah. today. Okay, right there. Good. Can you make that bigger? So, because I think that's what you're talking about. What I hear you saying, Mrs. Bruce Alice, that I don't hear you exactly saying, but this is what I hear. You want the confidence as a board member and the board to know that what's taught within a course is pretty fairly clearly defined and that there's adherence to the things that we say we're going to do and there's alignment across all of these different things. So adherence to board approved curriculum for each course or a series of plan instruction is a shared responsibility. So this structure of individual, the te teacher, the department at grade level, building level, there's a lot of people that support our academic program. Academics is how we spend 95 plus percent of our time. I mean, this is what this is what we do all the time. And there's a lot of uh, people that need to coordinate around that. The as a part of this, we have syllabi, we have open house, we have either Blackboard or Google Classroom. 
parents can see, so what a parent can see in the prototype isn't going to be as detailed as what a parent sees in a syllabus. So if your child is in ninth grade English, that teacher is going to have a syllabus and it's going to go into more detail than what the board is seeing at the prototype level. That syllabus for the parents is a commitment to what's in that course. So what we will be doing with 335 teachers and 12 building administrators in the district is making sure that that line of sight and consistency and alignment is there across all of those. So while our task is the prototype, we will also be looking at things like making sure that syllab syllabus or syllabi align to the things that we have there. So there's that sort of alignment. That's a lot of work that we need to do that involves a lot of people. Okay. Um, I feel good about the plan, the way that this is laid out now. I mean, I realize we would maybe tweak a little bit of language and every course has its own thing, but I appreciate this, what you brought before us. I mean, it was really what I kind of had in mind that it's something that is a plan. We can see it. It's on the website. Parents can see it. And like Dr. Miller said, like syllabi has a whole lot more information. Parents can, you know, dive in if they need more information. So thank you. All right. There was just one more piece that we talked about with new courses. So thinking about the sequence of when and how that happens. So yes. civics, I think, is a great example. So bringing that overview in front of the board in the spring for feedback, and then that course in particular needs to be in the program of studies in January and approved in the program of studies. And then during that same year, we need to look at resources to support that particular course. And then that course doesn't go in effect until the 25, 26 school year. So that sequence is what we want to do with new courses as well. I know Ms. Hillman, you had some questions about that. So end of year, bringing forward the framework that you just saw there in that prototype or something like that for approval. That gives us the green light to move it toward the program of studies and review resources to support it the following year and then it goes into effect for kids the year after that. All right. So Christina, um, as head of the academic governance, you know, the, the things I see we have to get done is we've got to get to the detail or um, this, this is sufficient, right? Are we satisfied with this? I think all the board members need to weigh in that this is acceptable with, after the changes that are made. We gotta figure out that's what we wanna make, right? And we gotta give a thumbs up before they do any work. We need the initial approach schedule, right? You got all, once they put all this, you know, Dr. Miller said, hey, it's coming, if, if be ready. So we need to agree to a schedule and how we're gonna approve, right? And then ongoing approval, standard operating procedures. So as things change, during the years, how do we go back and do that? So that, that's the things we gotta make sure we're really clear when we give, you know, understand what, what that all be. Those are the three things I see we have to complete. And, and that is in the curriculum plan. So if, again, it's the, the hardest bite of this for the board will be this initial review. I mean, there's no way, unless you want a phase in plan that takes 15 years. I mean, the bottom line is there's a bite of the apple that's coming and so the bigger the bite we take, the more we can establish a baseline based upon these new uh, expectations. Then it would move to an annual and I think we could be fairly, that'll lessen the scope of year over year review because you're only gonna be focused in on changes. Yep, yep, we gotta have a schedule. So just one other point. So this is a great example of why if we were to change to a, a different structure, I would want four of the most passionate board members on the Academic Achievement Committee to get in, to be in these meetings, because uh, I won't be at them. I might attend one or two, but I'm not gonna be at all these meetings. I have no desire to get in the weeds on this. So this is where I would look to the four that are passionate to give me the executive summary. Good point. Phil, I'm, I'm with one? you, Mark. Oh. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, yeah. Um, Dr. Pasquinelli, when you were talking about even new courses added to the program of studies, uh -huh. um, so when we're looking at the in-depth program review, and we're not adding new curriculum, but we're making, I think you call it a major modification. So are we waiting until the spring, let's say you do the in-depth program review in the summer, will we get the new curriculum the following spring and then it would be implemented in the next school year? Yeah, we have to back map it from when we want it implemented for our kids. Okay. So civics, again, is the perfect example. If we want students in that course in 25, 26, then 24, 25, we have to review resources. So at the end of 23, 24, yeah. we need the course approved in front of the board. 
for that to happen and we'd want to do that with all courses. Right. So even if it's not a new course, but you're making a suggestion to a change. Um, and Let's use, sci use science, use science yeah, because science. of the steel standards. Why don't you talk through that? Yeah, so <laughs> that, I mean, that would be something that will come out of the in-depth program review, which again, typically we present those recommendations in May or June. You know, that's the time that that would come forward. So those would be sig more significant changes because there's standards changes that are coming with this one. The work, though, couldn't be done by May or June. So the actual realignment of curriculum, remember, standards is our foundation. That would take the department a while to work through that, and then it would likely be the subsequent fall for, you know, the subsequent May for approval and then implementation in the fall. Okay, other comments? Dr. Pasquinelli, I thought this was well thought out. Oh, it was definitely a team effort. So, oh, thank 100 percent. But you, yeah, yeah, 100 percent. Under understood that. Okay. Kim. Carry on. Item 6.02 is another information item. During the week of October 18, <coughs> 2023 through October 2020, I'm sorry, October 23, 2023, Pine Richland School District received library book requests for reconsideration. I'm sorry, can I start over? <laughs> or you can kick it to me, whatever I'm gonna you prefer. I'm going to kick it to you because yeah, I can't talk, <laughs> yeah, <so laughs> which this might is, be a good thing. <laughs> this is, a, this is the, it's primarily here for public update. So in October, we know there was a lot of attention around library book titles. Uh, we have a process that's contemplated in 109.1 that had never been utilized in the district, and that is a request for reconsideration of library titles. So that prompted us to provide an update to the community solicit potential interested people to participate in that, on that committee. We have a 10-person committee that was formed. Lottery system was utilized for the parents slash community members. Our board vice president was present during that lottery along with the solicitor at the time and Mrs. Williams and myself. So those five staff members and five community members then through November, December, January have read independently all of those titles. They, their committee then comes together, and again, we've not utilized this process. This is the first time we've utilized it. The committee uh, came together uh, to discuss those books, and they will be providing me with a written recommendation. That's a written recommendation for each and every of the 14 titles that are under reconsideration. Uh, that has not been given to me yet, but I do anticipate it very soon. Uh, I will obviously look at the input of the committee. I will consider input that I've heard from board members. I will consider input from my own close read of each and every one of not only those 14 titles, but many other books I've read for the purpose of bringing my best recommendation forward to the board. So my, I believe I will have enough time to be able to share my recommendation on each and every one of the 14 titles to the board at the April 8th meeting. Um, my recommendation is that it's there for information discussion. That would be my recommendation. It's the board's decision. My recommendation will be information discussion. I would also make, I'll make some additional recommendations likely at that time for possible consideration by the board. Item 6.03 is also an information item. I'm gonna turn this one over to Dr. Pasquinelli. Thank you, Mr. Salas. Sean, if you can make that maybe a little bit smaller. So this, um, this is information in terms of the evaluation of textbook resources for our curriculum. And we've been providing these updates over the course of the year. So you can see the list of resources that we're evaluating and where we are in the process. But this is where, again, for parents and, and students to engage in evaluating resources. And it, um, so starting tomorrow, an e-blast will go out inviting anyone that wants to participate and looking at the resources here, so you see we have ELA grades six through nine, world language, Spanish, uh, statistics and pre-calculus and environmental science. Those are the resources that we're evaluating this year. Uh, it'll be an electronic option first for those that can't make it out here. And then we like to put the hard copies on display in this room the following week. So they'll be here for, that, for those that want to come out and touch, feel, and turn the pages. But the electronic option exists too. Uh, and then at the bottom of, of this particular agenda item is a link, or not here, but in the e-blast, is a link to an evaluation form. So again, that's to gather feedback. 
So great time to get engaged for families and students. We do ask our teachers um, to take a little bit of either class time to come down here or ask their students to look at the resources and give some of the feedback, especially the students that are living that course right now and which of those top two do they think that could, uh, uh, you know, would have helped support them to the greatest extent. Uh, and then you can see the timeline moving forward. At the April 8, we'll have an executive summary of the number one resource that we're recommending, and then it goes on a 30-day display at the library here, at the library in um, Northern Regional. And then that stays for 30 days, and then we come forward with a final recommendation for purchase. So that's just an update with the timeline, our top two, and please everybody be on the lookout for that e-blast tomorrow, and we ask as many people to participate that can. Okay. Any, Any questions? questions? Oops, sorry. No. Okay. So item 6.04 is a discussion information item regarding the planetarium. Yep, I'll take that. I'll get it started at least. I know we have a couple of our astronomy teachers there. there Mr. Duggar, or Mr. McCurdy, if you guys want to come over to the mic just in case there's any questions for you. But we did want to provide, I don't know why that image isn't showing up, but um, there's a nice image of um, our current system that's, that should be there. Yeah, and we got uh, it. I can see it. It's you can't. Okay. Place. So it starts with a little bit of the, the background with our planetarium. We've had that since the uh, high school was built. Um, extremely popular course. We mentioned this uh, in the past. We run about eight sections. We have about 200 students that request this course, senior course. They definitely connect to these two gentlemen very well, and, and they provide them with a great experience. The system is coming, what we, again, to the end of life. Is it working right now? Yes, it's working right now. It's getting to the point where replacement parts are no longer available, and our concern is if that part breaks and we lose it, then we, you know, we, uh, that obviously impacts a lot of students that, uh, that look forward to this opportunity. So we are starting the process of evaluating different systems that could replace or and enhance the current system, at least until it's no longer operational. So I thought maybe, guys, you talk a little bit through some of the options that we're looking at for the board. They're all listed here in the agenda for everybody to see. There are hyperlinks to, to look at them, and you can see the price range. You know, a very low end is a $50,000 to an extremely high end is over a million dollars. We are recommending budgeting around $650,000 in the capital funding plan for this. We have been talking about this for years, knowing that this date was coming, so it is something that you know, we were forward thinking um, about this particular item. So if you guys can talk just a little bit about those options that you're considering, and we did have a demonstration last Friday. It was nice to get a chance to see that live, too. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. I'm Troy McCurdy. This is Andy Duggar. Um, talking about some of the systems that we we're looking at 2019 we went to a, a big show in Toledo Ohio where we were able to see a lot of the the new things that are out there in astronomy um, our planetary being built in 1993 it's a totally mechanical optical system technology in 1993 when I was a sophomore in high school wasn't too good um, what we saw last Friday was, was just a huge upgrade to what we can currently do with our astronomy curriculum and not only that but for also classes such as chemistry, bio, and anatomy as well. So it can be used in other disciplines, which is very nice to see. That was the first one that we saw. It was a um, lens-based system from a Philadelphia company called Spitz. There's another company called Siler out of St. Louis who's gonna come out with a similar system. A um, Little bit pricier than the Spitz system. That one was around $400,000 that we just looked at. And we left very impressed. We are very impressed with what it has and the capabilities that it can do for our, our 200 plus kids that we have every year. And we're fortunate enough to have the top of the top, like Liam Francis that was just here going to Notre Dame earlier today to your average student that has no interest in college. And it, it's a blessing that we have them all there with us. Um, the other ones we have, there's another option to replace the system in the center of the room with an upgraded mechanical optical system which is a Seiler Zeiss company as well. Seiler's out of St. Louis, their parent company's out of Germany, um, which is Zeiss who makes a lot of optical equipment. We can't see that one because it would be ripping ours out and bringing a brand new one in. Um, so that one is, is tough for us to view. The other one that we're looking at is the Zeiss Velvet, 
that's the one that's going to be demoed here um, hopefully march 21st that's that's our goal which is uh almost two weeks from now on a thursday they'll come and set it up drive in from st louis and then on friday we'll demo it it's uh, a tremendous opportunity for our students to have an upgraded system the last one cost over three hundred thousand dollars in 1993 and um it, it's been a, a huge asset over the past 30 years whatever system we use going forward we'll hopefully get another 20 or 30 years out of as well anything you have? okay i'm open to well, we're open just, to any questions that you have um time happy to have anybody come in and see what we have as well if you want to see the current system we have by any means we're happy to show you um we're blessed to to, to be here teaching the kids we love what we do and that's why we think we are so fortunate to have the kids take the class. Can you expand on the utilization of this beyond astronomy, okay. just so I have an appreciation? Because when I look at three to four hundred thousand dollars, I'd like to know how that how that investment is utilized beyond the astronomy class. Absolutely, and that's right now it hasn't been, um, other than bringing in elementary kids or middle school kids for planetarium shows. Uh, right now we teach every period of the day, so that's pretty hard for us to do. The new systems being a lot of software and a lot of applications, they have some anatomy applications for the human body where it, it's really this, the system that we saw is the exact same one that the Carnegie Science Center has. So if anybody's been to the Carnegie Science Center and seen some of the things that they have down there, you could zoom into the skeletal system or the nervous system for anatomy and, and break down the different parts of the body. Um, we are looking in lunch with a chemistry teacher where they're showing organic molecules for organic chemistry and the bonding patterns between them. So there's applications that this one that we just saw has that can tie into chemistry, biology, um, anatomy, organic chemistry. We didn't have time to see the physics applications. Um, and I'm assuming the next system that we'll have come in as well in two weeks, we'll have some of those as well. Obviously, we'd have to work up the scheduling, you know, and move classes and things like that but we can definitely do things like that to have biology classes come in a certain day or chemistry classes come in a certain day to use the planetarium. You said the visits the 22nd, the actual demo is the 22nd or 21st? That, that last Friday before 22nd. spring break. That's our hope. That's a little quick for a, a full visit, but once we figure out the time, uh, we can inform the board and anybody, even a couple of people, if you can come out, the, the system we saw, there was maybe a dozen of us in the room, in the planetarium to view the last system, it will blow your mind. <laughs> yeah, I'd like and to. And so, see. again, I don't know about the next one, but if it's similar to what we saw, yeah. it, it is an experience that cannot be told to you verbally here that if you see uh, might be beneficial. Nice. And how it, I'm sorry, go ahead. Amy. No, I just, I just wanted, because there's all these um, boards on here, and I, I just want to be clear. We're so the one that you saw is option three on this list, correct? That's that the one that you just had the demonstration last That is last correct, week. Okay, and then three. the one that's coming on the 22nd, is that 5B? That 5B. is 5, um, let me see. Because there's yeah, like- 5B, correct. 5B, okay, yes. that's what that, that makes it, I can yes, look at the correct. prices of that. Okay, awesome, thank you very much. Okay, question on the digitalis system, just the option number two. Yes. Um, you saw that it would not integrate with our current system. What do you, what do you mean by that? So the, Spitz, the company that we have now, the machine we have now is a German-made company called Zeiss. Their okay, subsidiary is, is Seiler from St. Louis. The Zeiss system that we are looking at hopefully in two weeks here would integrate with our current system as well so we could use them together. Uh, the Spitz system would be totally separate than what we have and it would not be able to use side by side. We'd have to turn one off and one on, one off, one on if we wanted to continue to use the 30-year-old 30 30 -year machine. Um, the Zeiss system, we'd be able to use them together and do things on both if we wanted to. Based on what we saw last Friday, there's not much of a need to use the systems together. What they have nowadays, the, the technology and the resolution is almost it, it, it's pretty impressive. It's, uh, and what we saw was not as good as what I think we will see in the future too with what they would bring in. They did not bring in their top level lens for us because it's so expensive. They have like a, a traveling lens that they take for the uh, demonstrations and it was one from a couple <coughs> years ago 
compared to the newer one that has twice the resolution. Um, I can't imagine what it would look like. I mean, I was amazed with what they had. So the um, back on, still talking about digitalis system option too. You, you've got Gateway North Hills and Seneca Valley. Are they using that system solely, or are they trying to use with? The, do they have two systems like from you? Our, sorry, uh, from our memory and from what we we went and visited the school several years ago and talked with them, their systems that they currently use, it's just the discharge, just the discharge system itself. Okay, so that suffices for them, so they get what they need out of it. How, how different are your requirements, not thinking about what you currently have there, Digitalis system, how different is, are, are your requirements compared to those schools? Uh, I guess the curriculums, there's probably a lot of similarities with the curriculum. Um, the big difference I would say between the two is, is they might have two classes of an astronomy while we have eight. I think that's a big difference. Um, our original system in 1993 is better than what they currently have, and, it, and it's not even close. Um, and that's the digitalis system option too, is what that's they currently correct. have. Correct. It's, I don't want to say it's not good, but it's, it's when, when we left there, we, we were extremely disappointed. Okay. Well, those are good comments. Yeah, that's what I need to hear. Yeah, don't don't hold back. Okay. The quality of the image for digital, <laughs> yes. I mean, the price you can see, the quality of the image for digital is, is going to be much less even though we currently have right now with our 1993 version. Okay. All right, that helps. So I want to make sure I understand. So in the opening paragraph, you're proposing that we budget 650 And is that because... Is it just coincidental that option 5B is 650? Is that the one you're thinking we'll, we'll land on or? That's a great question. Um, until, we see. In, until we see it, we don't know. That is the priciest of the options, the ZEISS system. Um, they say it's the best system. I, we were extremely impressed with what Spitz had the other day. I would be shocked if it's that much better. Um, ZEISS is, all their products are more expensive than the Spitz products. They say they're the, you know, the, the, the best products out there. We have gone 30 years out of what, what they've had in there since 1993. Um, and that, that 650, even if we would recommend that Zeiss system, there's two different ways they could mount that. One would be in the center of the room. One would be in the cove system. And the difference between those two ways that they can implement them, one way would be $500,000, give or take a few dollars. One would be 650000 as a worst case scenario if they can't install it in the center of the room. Gotcha. And the aspect and the reasoning behind that six six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, we were still in the discovery process within the ten year capital plan for twenty four twenty five. So we want to play it as safe as possible with that six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Gotcha. Maybe you guys can get together with Mr. Zimmerman. Some of those advertisers might want to advertise in a planetarium. <laughs> See if we can turn this into a revenue stream there, too. <laughs> Absolutely. I have a question. Is there a different value or um, like a uh, warranty or long lasting of either one of these products that would benefit one over the other? That's a great question. Um, we know with Spitz is a one year warranty mm -hmm. to start and then they offer service contracts year to year. Um, we used to have a service contract with Zeiss when I started back in 2005 where they would come and service it every three years and maintain it. Um, they'd have to fly over from Germany, which obviously was a little bit wow. expensive. Since about 2012, I would guess, 2011-ish, somewhere in there, we stopped doing that and we just call them to come over as needed, which I think there's been two times in the past decade where we've had to have them come over. Mm -hmm. um, that would be something for you know the board to discuss if a warranty package is, is obviously worth it or not. I have not gotten a price from Zeiss yet on a warranty package or how long that would last. I'm sure next Friday we'll have all those answers for you. Your Spitz um, Digistar, that's the one you demonstrated. Yes. And you were very pleased with that demonstration as I yes. understand it, make sure, okay. Um, again, it would not integrate with the current system, which means you need to keep two. So the the new system that the Spitz is, it can do everything that our old system can do, plus 
99% more. Um, so then that becomes obsolete. Correct. And, and Okay. Does that get then removed? That, that's a great question. That, or that's is that your fallback in case well. your warranty doesn't work and something <laughs> happens? I, I hate to get rid of something that yeah, could be used at times. And that's right. that's something Dr. H and yeah. Mr. Zimmerman and everybody would have to discuss what, what's best for the school. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. It is an antique. It is yeah. antique. Yeah. You sell it. Last part of this is just around timeline. Sean, if you could scroll up just a little bit. So. We still obviously have work to do in terms of making a final recommendation, and we have some work to do in terms of the purchasing process that we're digging into with this because it's kind of a unique purchase. So we'll keep the board updated like, uh, like we mentioned here. Uh, and again, if that works out, that you can come out uh, for that demonstration, some of you, that would be great. Are, are you looking at 9 o'clock again? That sounds good to me. You, I let that in their hands last time because they came in the day before and set up. And Are they up. coming in the day before this time? They, they they would be, yes. Yeah, so do we have any board members who can commit to Friday the 22nd? Let me see. Just a second. I, I can't. I'll be out of town. It is a, absolutely I something to be experienced. Yeah. I think I can be there. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can be there. One, two. Yep. Mr. Cassidy, three. What good. Mrs. Miller, four. Okay. 9 a.m.? Okay, well, that's four. Yeah, 9 a.m. Oh. Um, oh. We'll meet you. won't be me because I have a music and art thing with Mrs. Gustafson that morning. We, we will not be available because we have a music and art meeting. But beyond that, uh, Mr. Dr. H or someone will meet you at the front door, and you'll get to see. If you haven't seen a planetarium, it's a great experience. How long will that last, do you think? I think you can that? leave whenever you need to. Okay, but it will probably be an hour to an hour and a half, but you can stay for 20 minutes, stay for a half hour. Yeah, 20 you, minutes is probably a max. I, I have a conflict at, uh, at uh, 10, 1030. Okay, but I'll so, uh, put that more, out there and we'll put it. Just one more question. When, I'm sorry. When, no, when go ahead. I'm done. So, Chris, I just have a question for you. So, in the last finance governance meeting, um, the $11 million that is bu currently budgeted, capital projects it yes. included the scoreboard did it also include the 650 yes okay thank you and, and we had bumped that to the 650 for the last okay. one all right thanks no problem thank you thank you thank you guys thanks guys item 6.05 is a reminder and review of the academic achievement meeting which was held on february 27th 2024 I think we pretty much summed that up with our last item, so. <laughs> yes, I believe so. Our next meeting is scheduled for May 20th, 2024. Tentative topics are the in-depth program reviews currently being worked on by various departments. Mm -hmm. That's our science light, so we'll be talking about our science program. Okay. All right, hold on. Thanks, Christine. Okay, student services. Lisa? Agenda item 7.01. Um, this is student service action items that were approved in the consent agenda earlier. Agenda item 7.02 is an information item for board consideration at the April planning meeting. Is a motion to approve the student attendance and application of the student discipline code for the girls volleyball team to travel to Mechanicsburg, PA from Friday, September 20th 2024 to Saturday, September 21st, 2024, to participate in a volleyball tournament as described on the attached field trip request form. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, item eight, staff services. Mike? Sure. Item 8.01 is a motion to approve the PREA, PRESPA, Act 93 personnel and athletic non athletic supplementals as attached. Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on this item? Okay, all in favor? Yes. 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 All opposed? Okay, motion passes. Item 8.02 is a motion to approve the comprehensive K through 12 guidance plan and K through 12 school counseling curriculum as attached. Second. So discussion. Motion has been uh, made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Yes. Yeah, Phil, can I go first? You, you sure. Sure, go right ahead. So I guess I, I just want to start by 
acknowledging Dr. Paxson and all the work that has been done within the district and certainly the people in the community who have come out to speak about how the counselors have had such a profound impact on your, on your individual families and, and acknowledge that and recognize it and grateful for it. Um, my impression, having gone through this, is that our counseling program goes beyond what the state requires. Um, maybe you can argue whether it's significant or substantial, but it goes beyond. Um, and I think, well, I don't think, I know I've received, my, my short time on the board, this has gotten the most, mo most attention. Um, people in favor and people who are not so much in favor. So I guess my comment to the board would be at the end of the day, um, if I'm going to support the plan, then it has to be coupled with an opt-in arrangement um, so that those families who, for whatever their reasons are, uh, choose not to have their children participate in that counseling plan, that they have the ability to opt in and that there's some alternative arrangement made. Um, you know, if they don't opt into the counseling program when those assemblies are held or whenever the larger gatherings are held, that there's some alternative for those families' children to continue whatever academic purpose they're, they're seeking to achieve. And in my mind, that, I'll say, splits the baby um, in that, you know, those families who value this program have the benefit of it, and those families who are not as enthused have the ability to have their children pursue their other academic pursuits. Thanks. When you say opt in, do you mean opt out? No, I mean opt in. So unless a family opts in, they're not participating. So how would that work? Well, that, we'll have to figure it out. But, but I think that has to be, you know, the, the burden. A burden. I want the key word there. A right. burden. But the burden needs to be on the district. So too. for families that want it and don't opt in, miss out on it. So the burden. Is on the family to pay attention, yes, and, and make a decision, affirmative decision. But that but burden would also be carried by the school. Understood. Uh, understood. But the, the, like I said, this has gotten a lot of attention and people are passionate on both sides. And it would be my impression that those families that are passionate about having their children participate will make the effort to opt them in to that program. So why not opt out? My preference would be- Because if you're just as passionate and you're engaged, it sounds like which the people we've heard from are very passionate and engaged. Ashley- Which I can attest to by the emails we get, like you're saying. So I'm not sure why the opt-in is the go-to. Well, because I think this goes well beyond what the state mandates, okay? This program goes beyond state mandates. Mr. Weathorn, can I just add? Sure. First and foremost, we're so grateful for our school counselors and their expertise. We really helped support creating this comprehensive counseling plan. And it does, and I just go back to a little bit of a history, um, and I'm aging myself a little bit, but um, in 2006, uh, we were part of creating this comprehensive counseling plan, and it did have academic, personal, social, uh, as well as career. And when you, and then in 2015, again, we're looking at that comprehensive counseling plan, which we approved that looks at personal and social, career, as well as, um, as well as academic. So looking at those three areas, we did the in-depth program review with our school counselors that recommended, listen, let's look at that academic, social, emotional, as well as career. So looking at this as a whole, our Pennsylvania does recommend as part of our 339 comprehensive counseling plan to create a comprehensive counseling plan. We're required to have career specifically, but looking at a best practice approach, we approach it with academic, social, emotional, as well as career to best support our students. And I do go back to specifically in 2016, I mean, we were really affected and it deeply it saddens me to even share, we lost our students to suicide. And part of the social emotional components of this is suicide prevention, which is so important because as a community, we need to support our students. And that is our parents, our community members, our staff, all together, we work to support our kids. Now, isn't so, there a mandate for suicide prevention? There is. So that's outside of 
this particular discussion, we have to deliver that weather regardless. So I'm not sure that that's well, particularly a of, relevant. A lot of the social emotional goes, it crosses over with that suicide prevention where it talks about trusted adults, talks about building resiliency, as well as uh, supporting our students. Can I go? Oh. Yep. Go ahead. Can I go? Or are you, I'm I, sorry, oh. go ahead. I just want to follow up with something Dr. Pax Paxton said. So I'm looking at the in-depth program review that was presented to us in June of 23. And there are some comments included in here that, that come, here's a comment from staff for 2023. And they say that, well, I'll just read the entire comment. School counselors are not mental health counselors and need to stop being used as such. They cannot be used to replace therapists. The current office is understaffed. The counselor to student ratio is way too high. So that's a comment from Pine Ridge and staff. Yeah, and I could appreciate, I definitely could appreciate that because we are not saying that our school counselors are mental health counselors. They're not doing psychological tests. They're not doing mental health screeners. They are supporting preventative measures of going into the classroom, teaching about like trusted adults, teaching about how can we build resiliency. Another Wait, com oh, can I finish? Can I go ahead? Oh. Another comment in the in-depth program review is from a parent. Actually, it was from the parent focus group. And they said that the counselors aren't being accessible to the tier one students because they're being utilized in other areas. So that was a comment from a parent. Right. Um, I guess so my question would be, are we meeting the needs of the tier one students as far as academic and career planning go um, with their current workload of the counselors? Hmm. I think that gets a little bit to this slide we shared a couple of times is so this is what you know some of the current experience looks like and we believe that through the curriculum tier one for all allows us to be proactive and get to a more balanced of the three domains as opposed to as much time they were spending on social emotional those you know individual situations that are consuming a significant amount of the counselors time so that is the concept of the comprehensive plan for all. So if we have students that aren't able to meet with their counselor for academic purposes, are you still, do you still wanna stick with the ideal use of time where we're focusing one third on social emotional, but yet we're not meeting the academic needs of our students? Right. I mean, so if they're they waiting a month, if they're waiting weeks or a month because our counselors workload, um, there's so much for them to do outside of academic or career planning are we really meeting their needs yeah that's the concept of our challenge when they're spending this amount of time on the social emotional and not getting to some of these other domains then that becomes a challenge so if we can do more proactive strategies through our written curriculum for all to balance it to ensure that there's enough time for that what that dr pasmanelli is alluding to on the left that is reactive time for kids who are experiencing some type of conflict or a need that they have to seek the counselor out to sort out. Of, oftentimes it's a peer conflict or something like that. Um, or their own internal coping, right, that they need support. So that is a reactive sense. So right now, the reason why our counselors are not spending as much time in the academic realm or, or delivering more lessons like they would like to be doing is because they're in uh, like a firefighting mode. They're reacting, they're responding to the kids' needs in the moment as opposed to equipping them strategically so that then they can hopefully sort some of that out more independently and they would preserve the time to continue to see students. That is the goal, obviously. Really teaching some of those preventative measures. So what so, process is in place for when a counselor refers to like a mental health professional, for example? Would that would be through like a referral process where we'd work directly okay. with the family and it might be gone through our student assistance team. And think of it this way, it's a continuum. So it's not just like, we certainly wanna build resiliency in our students, but we also wanna have that continuum of support. It's not just one, everything fits this, it would be referring, it would be part of that student um, assistance process, working with the family to make that referral. Um, I have a couple comments I'd like to make. So first off, I want you to know that I am approving the plan. The plan. I do have some questions. Um, I know last week, you know, I asked questions and that was offensive and I apologize if that offended you. But I ask questions when I go to my doctor or when I've worked on in my house because I, that's what I do. So um, a couple of the questions that I had that, you know, like I said, I am in support of the plan, but I, I heard from people, a lot of people that had some concerns. So I want to ask some questions and just maybe 
that would clear some things up. So the reason I asked about the curriculum is that there was so much information in that curriculum. Like I think in the K-3, when I was counting today, the big idea is, I don't know if there was like 14 or 15 of those. And I look at our K-3 buildings, and like at Richland Elementary, Amy Molitor's there and there's 483 kids. So she's not teaching, she's not going into every classroom 12 and 14 times. I think like four times a year they see the whole student, you know, they go into like each classroom. So that's to me where they're delivering tier one services, correct? Right. That's, and that would just and be so four lessons a year. And so would go four times a year. Yes, so it's not all the time. Correct. And then um, all of... just pause, because I think yeah. that's an important point mm -hmm. that you just hit on because mm -hmm. we do hear a lot about the time that's being consumed away from academics that's not accurate mm -hmm. the academic time is valuable time and it is the vast majority of our focus four times a year at the k to three level is when tier one instruction is happening for our kids that helps them support better the academic you know that they're going to have those experiences in the in those classrooms so yeah it's just an important point well, I, yeah, and I get that, but then I, that's kind of my question is where, where are all these other 12 or 14, you know, say nine or whatever big ideas, wh how are those getting delivered by the counselor? And I think specifically, and I don't even know if, Brittany, if you would want to speak just a little bit about um, the, specifically we talked, we have four lessons per grade level. Mm -hmm. So it would be trusted adults. We talk about career, internet safety, and then also good health, promoting good mm -hmm. health and wellness at a student's level developmentally, where they are from a K through three perspective. Mm -hmm. So that's four lessons that are given to a student in like first grade, second grade, and third grade. Yeah. No, I get that, but I, like, like I said, it just seems like a whole lot. And that is kind of my question when I ask that, is we know our counselors are stretched thin. Mm -hmm. they, they're super important in our buildings. They have very important things that they do. Nobody's, nobody is denying that. But to me, that's when I looked at this, it felt like we were giving them more work to do, and that's, that's not what we want. We want them to be able to, like, I don't have a problem with going in four times a year, face, you know, seeing everybody so kids are familiar with who your guidance counselors are, but then kids who need more needs, have more needs, they can work with them. When parents reach out and say, hey, can you talk to my kid? Hey, can I sign my child up for this group? Like, those are the, you know, tier twos and tier threes that mm -hmm. parents are opting in. Right. And we're still providing those tier yes. two and tier threes. Okay. So just so everybody is aware of that. And again, our school counselors are not mental health counselors. And I yes, think it's important correct. for us to say, what does it look like? What does it sound like? And I really think it's important to say, okay, what does this look like at a K through three level? Just so we have a, an understanding of it. And I do, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to interrupt them, but I, I know people have concerns about the social emotional learning. There are concerns that they're values and family ideas are getting pushed into kids but like the ones that I read on here I did not see those so I that's why that is why I feel comfortable and that's why I am going to approve this so thank you yeah thank you very much <clears throat> um, so you did ask about our learning goals those are kind of our big ideas smaller learning goals it's more of a all-encompassing these are the things we're going to touch on in the lesson um, it's really we're not like delving super, super deep into them. So we do have quite a few that we can quickly touch on during that lesson. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I have a hard time seeing that small. <laughs> <laughs> well, and some of the question was about what are the other things versus mm -hmm. the four lessons that you're doing. So in recognizing that school is you know, a great place to make friends and identifying important places in the school building, those are things that we can talk about very quickly. Our buildings aren't that large. Um, there's not a lot of places they can go. And we do talk about what can you do to be a friend? How do you make friends? You know, in order to be a good friend, you also have to show that, you know, to make a good friend, you have to be a good friend. And what does that look like? Mm -hmm. And we do a lot of those things through discussion, um, reading picture books, um, and talking to the kids about their experiences and what they would like out of a friend and what mm -hmm. they would like to see and how they would like to be connected. No, I, I understand all that. And like I said, the, the part of just, you know, four times a year with everybody is kind of the thing that I'm, I'm okay with because mm -hmm. anything more intensive than that would be an opt-in situation where parents would sign up for something like that. And to me that, you know, that, that makes sense. And there was somewhere in this plan, because there was a lot in this plan, I spent a lot of time this week on this, about a calendar, what you, you know, we, like monthly calendar, what right. duties, and like, like I said, I know you do a lot. There's a lot of things that you do. So, um, you know, I, I support it, so. Mark, did you have some questions? <clears throat> yeah, I do, Phil, thanks. So, 
for me, the root issue in my thinking has evolved uh, over the years. And I remember those years, Mar, that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a, um, another spot that I've landed that is sort of a compromise. And I think the root issue, and, and there is uh, more and more evidence that going into the general classroom, mm -hmm. giving this to kids that don't need it, harms them. And that's what I'm concerned about. And there's enough people that are starting to realize this. And it sounds so good. I mean, I, I'm assuming no matter where you fall on this issue, if you don't have the best of intentions for the kids at heart, then you shouldn't be part of this conversation. So I'm giving everyone the benefit of the doubt, no matter what you believe, that you have the best of intentions uh, for the kids. Um, it isn't about the kids that need the help. There is value in giving them support. Tier two, tier three, very appropriate. General classroom tier one, it's not appropriate. And I won't support this plan. Um, so I will support, um, if we wanna worry about the deadline, then we can, we can uh, if we can't modify the motion tonight, uh, we can take care of what's needed and then continue the conversation. I'd like to see something in the middle that we land on here. Yeah, and talking about mental health, that's a myth. Like, if we're not putting that thought in a student's head when we talk about suicide or we're talking about mental health. They're already having those thoughts. So it's real important to look it's at... It's not like, a myth, Mar. It's not a myth. It's not a myth at all. And I think that's the problem we need to... If we're going to talk through this, we got to dispel that myth, that it's a myth. So in looking at resiliency, it's important to note that, like, building the resiliency of our students, and we talk about that with all students, but when it's resiliency is not enough, and that's something, Lisa, you have been asked, which I thought was a great question. When do we refer? When kids, when it's more than just stress, the intensity, the frequency, the duration, it's more than that two weeks, and kids are suffering from depression. When do we refer? And that's really what we work on as a team, and families are involved in that entire process with that referral. As currently structured and set up, they wouldn't be, and that's not appropriate. It's time to draw the line on this. Mark, are there specific learning goals that you've seen in the curriculum that you'd say are of concern? Well, so if I talk in terms of domain, Mike, uh -huh. I, I think I start with domains. So what is a proper scope? So career, of course, required proper domain. Uh, that's, that's acceptable. Suicide awareness, that's acceptable. So I'd keep those two as a foundation. And then I would look at academic uh, and the SEL components as excluding tier one and uh, include that for tier two and tier three support. Now right. academic at the secondary, we're talking about scheduling and supporting kids yeah, that's their a graduation different. plans. It's more the K through three stuff on the, on the mm -hmm. academic side, some of that stuff. Can you say specifically what stuff so we're all clear? Uh, yeah, it's in this document. I mean like say it out loud. Say it out loud. It's up on the screen, K through three. You want me to start with the academic domain? Sure. Hold okay. on, let me get there. I mean, that's, that's a, again, this is where there's, I have question marks. It, it, it would be something that I would question. Um, Which ones? You know, uh, the first column, big ideas, right? Okay. So I would question, would we want to do that in the general classroom? Well, what okay. about it are there you are, questioning? These kids have parents, right? Okay. There's parents involved here, right? Um, the, the more important section, the more important domain is, is, is the SEL domain. Okay. So that's the blue. That's blue, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, take this entire domain, yeah. all of it. Mm -hmm. but also students make positive one. connections at school. Not, it sounds really good, I know. Yeah. It sounds really but awesome. So what's bad about it? Just look at the learning goals also in the um, <clears throat> suicide prevention too, because there's some of that overlap language you're yeah, going to no, see. Yeah, I know, and I, and, and I get that. Mara said that. There's mm -hmm. some there's interweaving overlap. of this with that. Okay. So I would so ask. So what's the problem? I Ashley, would ask Ashley, us to. at the end of the day. Ashley, just, 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 just a minute. So Ashley, we can agree to disagree on this. That's perfectly fine. 
and I expect you to disagree with me on this issue, and that's fine too. I respect that. I just think so that we deserve clarification on where you have issues because you play a role that has a huge impact on whether or not this is carried out. Clarification it on where I have issues. A lot of people. A lot of people. Okay, so I think it's inappropriate. Okay. Can so look at, uh, there's no page numbers on what I'm looking at here. Go to, uh, uh, scroll down, Bill. scroll down, question. right there. All right. Grades K through three. Uh, big idea. Students learn coping strategies to help us. Course name. Describe how you feel in good times and when you have a problem. Where are we? I'm sorry. Right here. Okay. An example of what I'm talking about. That is not appropriate in the general classroom. Let's get on with teaching Why? subjects, okay? So Excuse that me, is let's that put is the comments in, in out in the Yeah, let's be respectful. Please. Okay. So so I want everyone to witness here, okay, those that simple disagreement, there's all kind of disrespect now going on. Okay? So no more comments from there or I'll ask, I'll ask you to leave. All right, this is the board discussion, not the community discussion. You have your moments. Please carry on, Mark. Thank you, Phil. So this is what I'm talking about when those that actually make fun of me and says DeWitt's not a uh, space where we can express what we feel because this is why I said that. Now, I'm a white male, so I guess that excludes me from being felt that way. That makes me, that makes me right, uh, that makes me the most radical uh, school board candidate in the state of Pennsylvania. Okay, so listen, I'm giving you my genuine opinion and it is based on education it's also based on being a parent mm -hmm. and we can just agree to disagree on this I don't expect to persuade you but I have a vote it's one of nine and that's the fact so I'm trying to work out something that I can live with that I rep and I represent people that feel this way mm -hmm. and I'm also Hearing the other side too, and I want to arrive somewhere. Everyone, no one's going to get everything that they, that they want, but some everyone can get something that they want if we actually listen. So, Mark, um, I'll make a comment. It sounds like you have a lot more questions to to ask. You're not comfortable with what's there. You want to have more interaction uh, with with Miss um, Paxson and others to to make sure that you you know whatever the comfort level between the both need to get to. Um, and I do know we have a date coming up here, March 31st, where we've got to submit to the Pennsylvania 339 um, policy where we have vocational educational requirements that we've got to meet. Um, if we go through a, a vote here today and let's say um, one at one time it says it's voted down, then they're, they're up against missing the deadline. So Phil, can but, I? Uh, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm still talking. Um, and on this vocational education, you know, part of that is is the requirements are the vocational and the career side, which you know I've spent all weekend going through this, and I understand what what's happening. It, it, I understand to my my level best of understand what's going on, and, and the career side looks looks very favorable uh, to to put forth. Now you made a motion, or no, you you offered up a motion to amend, you know, based upon that career. Do you want to do anything with with that? At this time well I I, I don't want to amend the motion okay however we if we want to take care of passing what's required tonight then we should and I'm okay with that if we want to do that that would just be going to um, the career right right um, now we have a few more weeks and I don't know if this is even possible but but I, but even if we have a few more weeks before March 31st to talk like this again about it and have a vote on it, then I'm, I'm just expressing where I would need to land mm -hmm. to even vote then for it. Okay. okay. Thank you. I give the floor to Mike. Mike, you had a question. Yeah, I, I do. So I'm going to put Dr. Miller and Mr. Hoffman, welcome to this show, um, on the spot because if we miss the March 31st deadline, what's the consequence? Is there a consequence? Is it just a letter from the Pennsylvania Department of Education that said you missed the deadline, turn your plan in? Or is there something more meaningful if we take the time to work this out beyond March 31st? I don't know if you know the answer. I mean, I, 
I'll give you my best professional thought. Okay. I'll defer to Mr. Hoffman if you'd like to take a crack, but I'm comfortable answering. Okay, so I'm going to reframe the question. We have never asked that. We take pride in attempting to hit deadlines. I appreciate that. And sure. we did not start this process last week. Understood. So for three months, we have been bringing forward all the elements of this plan. The quick answer is submitting the career component will comply with the requirements of 339 and PDE. If pushed to this, that would be my recommendation. That's not my recommendation, but if that is the only course of action to meet our deadline, meeting deadlines is important to me and I think we should do so. Okay. Something Dr. Paxson said that maybe wasn't heard, and I'm going to say it in this space. And I'm saying it to, this is to the board, not the community. The contents of this plan are not substantively different in any way, shape, or form than what was approved by our board in 2006 or was approved by our board in 2015. Not substantively different. The elements and dimensions that are there are elements and dimensions that have been there. What is changed and what is, a, and we're sensitive. This earlier today, we were talking about through either through joint governance or through committee structures. How do we know what the strategy is? What are we focused on? How do we engage and increase ownership? The strategy of the district was unanimously board approved in our strategic plan. Unanimously board approved. Some things came up during the unanimous approval of the strategic plan like concern over SEL. That was heard loud and clear from the community and discussed in the board. There was concern over um, the use of a universal screener in this area. And so we had conversation about that. I bring up 2006 and 2015 because what has been happening in Pine Richland schools for 20 years is not fundamentally, substantively different today than it was then as we work with kids on what does it mean to be a part of a class? What does it mean to engage uh, and, and help others? What does it mean to be a friend on a playground? What does it mean, where do I go if I don't have a friend on a playground? I mean, these are things that could sound like SEL, but at Wexford Elementary, they have a buddy bench. The buddy bench is literally a bench that it, you can go sit, if you don't have somebody, play, you can go over there and somebody can match up with you, and this matters to kids because this is part of what growing up is. And again, it allows the access to, uh, to learn. It just, it makes, it makes school a place where kids love it. Strategic Challenge 4 was our biggest challenge. Strategic Challenge 4 was the in influence of local, state, and national politics on the day-to-day -day operations of our school district. That was discussed at length with the board during the planning phase. That emerged through the strategic plan process. And that continues to be something in front of us. But I get concerned about the specific details. So when, when we look at what our counselors are doing, Mara said it. There's a continuum of, of services and supports. Every service and support is absolutely not for every student in our district. There's no question about that. And there are professional boundaries that believe, they, they carry a burden. They carry a burden of information. They know a lot of stuff about a lot of families. They do not take the responsibility of that knowledge and their, their own training to go beyond that. We've not seen evidence of that. They don't try to go over their skis in order to, to do things that, are, that they're not confident and comfortable with. Our parent, the opportunities for parent engagement, this is not, this is not an attempt to diminish the value of the family. This is not an attempt in any way, shape, or form to devalue the voice of parents or the parents' role and responsibility in raising their child. Not at all. Not at all. 
in our public school for the past 20 years, I've only been here 11, this is a part of an overall program, an educational program, that helps our kids grow up and learn. And learning is learning in a lot of different, I mean, that's just what it is. I get worried that we're talking about things that are not in the actual day-to-day -day experience of our kids. There may be some schools that don't promote parent engagement. We are not one of them. And we communicate with our families. Are we perfect? No, but we communicate a ton. So I don't think there's a, I can't imagine there's a consequence beyond receiving some sort of official letter saying, hey, you didn't turn it in on time, you need to turn it in. I don't believe we should miss that deadline because we have no reason to miss that deadline on career. But I do believe strongly that the people that we have in our roles supporting the overall educational program have, do not have a hidden agenda. Well, just for the record, I, I did, I, I, just Thank for the record. Yes. Okay. So I did, didn't insinuate that anyone had a hidden agenda. Everyone has the best of intentions. Mm -hmm. Correct. And thinking, yeah. thinking is allowed to evolve as you become more educated. So what I approved in 2016, uh, it's, it's a different time. Different things are known. I know, I know different things and I know more. So uh, that is what's different here. And that is why I tried to share my thinking is different about this. Mm -hmm. And I do think that there is uh, a place we can land that still provides the kids that need the help, help. But I think but, what but they're I'm saying is all the kids need this help. No, that's I don't think that we're saying. Um, no. That's no. not your decision. Though. No, but that, that we've not. It's been like surveys. No. All right. We've all right. had hold, 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 program hold, hold reviews. The, hold the no, that's not what we've, we've had been professionals told. tell us what they see on the ground. I feel like when we talked about last week at on the 27th, you know, we all agree that we weren't getting the weeds. This is the weeds. We're I'm in gonna it. I'm going to jump in right now because Wait. I've been patiently just, just, waiting. I, was, I, was, I know, just a minute. Our, we our, are in the weeds. We then, said yeah. we were not going to do this, and For we're doing it. We're not collaborating. <laughs> we're not collaborating. We're telling them we, we want to take things me. out. I know. I understand. Okay, you done? Okay, okay. Christina. So I'm going to go back to the strategic planning comment. I, I appreciate the strategic plan. I appreciate the process. I appreciate the vote that we took on that, but strategic planning does not replace good governance. And here we have again another curriculum before us that is being seen for the first time. We know that counselors, and again, we appreciate the good work that you're doing. We know that you're in the classrooms, and this is the first time that we're here looking at a curriculum in how many years that we've been doing this. And I'm looking at some of the things on here and I know that we've approved zones of zones of regulation we approve Naviance we approve smart futures but I see a number of resources on here that we haven't approved so I'm wondering where within our policy do we need to begin reviewing some of these and give the community opportunity to review some of the resources such as the books that are being brought into the classrooms um, so that we can get some input on that as well since we are going into the classrooms it's been available since january 22nd to the public well when it we started have, being if discussed. you know our process Actually, wait till she's done if you know our process mm -hmm. they're brought forward as an information item and then we give 30 days for review and that officially hasn't happened and is this an instance where we need to have that because even though we've been talking about it there is always an official, and I can pull up, text selection process um, brought before the board, and then there is an, a f there's an official, and we just talked about it, period, where, where community members and board members can review the books and give comment and, and feedback. So I'm wondering, do these resources you referencing all the resources for academic as well as uh, well, social, many of the academic ones, as I'm going through here, I mean, many of the academic ones were using, you know, it's the course selection. We have mm -hmm. approved them as part of our, our curriculum. Like I said, Smart Futures, we have approved that. Um, we have approved Naviance, which is used a lot. What we haven't approved are maybe some of these items in the social-emotional 
digging into those and allowing the community to see them, review them, and give us feedback about the appropriateness of them. I know as a parent of a child in K to three, actually more than one child in K to three, um, we get these things to come home. And so I do, you know, after the fact, I get letters. This was taught in the classroom. And I appreciate that we're finally having discussions about this on the front end of it. So I do think, you know, sometimes it's a surprise, oh, I get a book this thick, I have the benefit of being on the board having reviewed mm -hmm. zones of um, regulation. I mean, there was a quite a lot, large handout at one point that was handed back. I know it's getting, you know, my kid is responding to it. I have emojis on, mm -hmm. on <laughs> papers all over the house. but. You know, it was always a little bit bothersome that I got it on the back end of it instead of on the front end. So I think these conversations on the front end are important. And so I'm wondering if there is a place to have this review process that help us helps us get to where we need to be. And do these resources rise to that level? I know, I mean, are we considering these things like core text? Are we, how, how are we approaching these, these and some books. of them are books, and some of them, when you look at the suicide prevention, some of it is um, resources for suicide prevention as well that um, we've reviewed as teams and our best practices approach. Certainly would be okay with you looking at all of them, but it is a best practice approach in terms of how we're approaching it right now. So if I can maybe, I don't, want to, I don't want to interrupt okay. you, but um, so I, I want the people on the board to, because I understand where people are concerned about you know looking at school counseling services being delivered to tier one students and you know Ashley I'm sorry you're incorrect because it's I think we've been told 80 percent or 80 percent of our kids function fairly well at school and don't need interventions for on the social emotional learning par oh, partially. I didn't mean interventions I just meant like a baseline like if you go to these well what I'm saying for the most part those kids come to school and they're they're well prepared and they right. have executive like functioning and so develop forth skills yeah. for success yes. in and out of the classroom yeah. okay like yes basic. so right. okay fine so but I would like the board to hear what I'm saying it's we're only talking four times a year a 30 minute lesson so out of the whole year it's just two hours of it mm. now is this something I don't even know if anyone would would be interested in this or just a way to get this done if it could be kids could opt out of that lesson in their class in their third grade classroom like would that be something that we could discuss or land on I'm just saying I well, mean we, we always work case by case with families mm -hmm. I mean that happens all the time for a variety of topics so Thank you. So it would be some just per se, like I said, um, you know, an email would go out like this week or this month is, you know, guidance counselors are going to be coming into your third grade classroom and doing blah, blah, blah. And parents could say, hey, I'd rather my child not do that. And they could just, I mean, is that something that is feasible? It's more manageable than an opt-in, mm -hmm. I can okay. tell you that. Okay. But, um, well, I, like I, we, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if anybody's going to go it. Is for it is something but. that we have offered to families. Like I have said, I'm coming in on this day. I have fielded questions about it, and I have yet to have anyone opt out. One thing we were, um, that was just calling over to, to Jen and the crew, but the, so like, have you filled a bucket today? That's a book that's in here. That would be an example of something that also would show up in the library. So there are some resources that we're pulling from our own library um, sure. as like a supplemental. Right, but I'm sure To Kill a Mockingbird is also in our library. I, you know, at what, le at what so point do we decide that something needs to come before I think that was like our goal number three in our February 27th joint governance meeting. We were really talking about like teachers need to supplement things to make relevance. We had like the eight reasons why you might supplement yes, right, a lesson. But if it's used consistently, if there, what is it, policy 10, Help me out. Nine. Nine. Resources, nine. If a resource is used consistently, then that and is written into the curriculum, that's not a supplemental. So, can I speak to the uh, bucket fillers? There were, we have some vets here um, in the district. Bucket filling was like Ram's way before Ram's yes. way. Mm -hmm. Like it that's was. My kids did Every, yep. if you have a child at Pine Richland who was here from what, probably 2005 <laughs> to 2015, they were bucket fillers and all around the school. And basically, mm -hmm. the whole concept of the, the bucket filler is you fill someone else's bucket. You do that by nice actions, nice words, being a good friend, all the, all the stuff that we're talking about. So my guess is they could, 
the counselors could at the K to three they could speak to every one of these, and many of them have a story. The bucket filler is a perfect example because it it was literally huge. I mean, it was everybody was bucket filling. That was all we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one more question? Sure. What data do we have um, that we believe that doing these things on the front ends are gonna is gonna make an impact on freeing up your time so that you can be more balanced in in mm -hmm. delivering more of the tier one career education academic advising um, that seems to be falling. I don't want to say behind, but we're not able to meet everyone's meet needs. needs. So we don't, I mean, we don't have universal data to support, um, you know, student behavior or anything like that to look at that, to compare from before or after. Um, that's not available to us. But, you know, doing these things proactively, teaching a child, for example, to be a bucket filler, and what does that look like, and this is what we're going to agree on in the classroom. Again, for 80% of those kids, that is understood, it's expected, and that is what they are going to do whether we say it to them or not. But it helps create that, you know, that climate where that expectation is understood within the classroom. And so then if we have students who are struggling, you know, we have a common language. We have some common coping strategies that everyone knows so that their friend could even say, you look like you're frustrated, you know, like, do you want to go use a fidget? Do you want to, you know, like, do you need help? Can I get a teacher for you? Do you need to talk to someone else? Like it, it creates that um, preventative approach. And, and I guess on the continuum, what's she was just, a, it's a very light and fast touch. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, so it's, it's on the continuum. It's, it's in, it's very natural and flowing. It's conversational. It's not, it's not an event so much as it's just like the the way the day moves and the way the building operates and that's really how the kids mm -hmm. i think experience that and i think but too oh, oh go ahead you oh. can finish the oh. last okay um you know our support allows the teachers to focus on the content that needs to be taught you know and so the teacher is not an expert in math and also you know an expert on student behavior and classroom strategies they are right but we can come in and come alongside them and be a support to to be that voice of just as you know supportive assistance but if we've been doing this for mm -hmm. x number of years what is going to change why why hasn't it changed already why is your pie graph still so askew um if this is what we have just been doing all along like what is what are we doing differently that's going to make an impact for you? Because all I'm hearing is we're already doing this. Well, we we are to, oh, go ahead. I was going to say we layered in zones of regulation. So there are things we have in the last couple of years just put into place that were new layers. So those I think we are seeing the fruits of that are, are changing the way that that looks. And the other thing is we're, we are bolstering tiers two and three, right? So there are you know more supports and groups that we're working with the families primarily and then also our counselors to, to and, and I zones of regulation is K to three so mm -hmm. what's going to impact the career counseling and the academic counseling at the high school what are we going to do different there to make sure your time is more balanced so going back to this so to the pie charts yeah. can you pull that up I mean part of the reality of the left it could be a student mm -hmm. i mean a a student a single situation could dominate the time of a school counselor for a whole day i mean it literally um a handful of students with more intense needs requires significant time not always i mean it doesn't work like that but it depending on what's happening in a school day so i you know again we talked about this last time this is like an estimate if we average out what's happening. So in the, in the average, the goal is to slightly move the needle and become more balanced across those. I know at the high school, unless something has changed, the, the program of studies timeline was for every student to have a meeting brief with every, every counselor and every student. So there's design times for, again, it's not, it's not a long conversation, but as they're developing their course requests and what they're thinking about, they get a few minutes with their counselor in a setting, classroom type setting where they're rotating through the counselor 
and the counselor is, is looking at their what's your what's your plan ahead sheet look like what are you thinking about for your courses next year it's that kind of dialogue that works for the majority of kids just a quick check and balance there about what's going on some students at the high school might require a little bit more thought and planning in terms of their course load or what they're thinking about the comment we heard earlier that's concerning i mean i, I would want to understand that and know more about that circumstance to know mm -hmm. why it would take so long so again that's not something I would talk about here necessarily yeah. but, but it seems like it's not isolated because the IDPR I mean when you look at the comments those comments are reflected you know that that theme is reflected in the comments from I think the staff might have timed out so I can't pull it up no we talk to the staff all the time we know what they say I mean mm -hmm. we understand I, mean, I'm, I know but I, I'm just going off of what I know I don't talk to the staff all the time I, I only have I closed it so I don't have it open anymore yeah but in re it's recommendation number two the role of the counselor mm -hmm. is what you're speaking to and then there's like the internal analysis and external correct, and, correct. Then, yeah. and there's some comments there that I mean this was how many years ago was this last year two years 23 ago? okay yeah. uh, okay so sooner so this is recently so and, and when we're talking about well that time could be one student or ten students or you know but we're still targeting this to to the tier one so I don't understand how yeah, and I I do think like the hope is and we've seen it for example within suicide prevention is the cumulative effect of teaching that at tier one for all students so if we start in K3 and they've been taught the zones of regulation, then when I get them at four, five, six, I don't have to start over teaching the zones of regulation to kids who are struggling to regulate their emotions. They have that base knowledge just from being in the classroom for those classroom lessons. And then I can take that and go a little bit farther in depth. And it will take time, you know, but as we teach those strategies to the children, then that should help us to reduce the time that it takes to really you know, go deeper onto those topics if that's what's needed. So for example, trusted adults, you know, my, my fourth graders, my fifth graders, we start, you know, on the lesson on trusted adults and they know exactly what that is. You know, they're like, we've been talking about this forever. And I'm like, yeah, I know. We're just gonna quickly, you know, go over it. You know who your trusted adults are. You have trusted adults at home, you have trusted adults at school. Let's talk about times when you need to see a trusted adult, right? So if you are in the community, you know, and you're at a practice or a game and something happens, who are you gonna go to? Like, let's just talk about it, think through it. Um, and I can't do that as quickly if I didn't have that base knowledge from K3. And so that cumulative effect can continue, hopefully, therefore, giving us more of that time to focus in other areas. And really, that's that preventative measure where less kids will be at tier two, tier three, if we have that preventative measure at a tier one. We find out about so many different things from kids that tell us that they've started to run all the way back in elementary school. Um, anytime we're with our students at the high school in assembly, we always flash a, a slide in front of them about, you know, safe to say something, reporting mechanisms, trust, that trusted adult concept because we want kids to come to us to share those things um, as they see concerns. And, and nine times out of 10, they're, they're false alarm, but you know, one time out of 10, two times out of 10, we're finding some real <coughs> life problems that we're proactively able to step in solve and, and help improve the situation. Um, I'd go back to the pie chart too, just something to, to throw out there. Positive that this team has done. Um, the school-based mental health therapists that you've approved that are in our schools mm -hmm. are working with some of our students that are of, of the highest need and they're having a really positive impact on those students. So as they continue to work with those students more, I think all of their caseloads are full right now, that pie chart will, will, will shift mm -hmm. as well and allow us to focus on It's part of that process. referral process through SAP yeah. and with parent permission. I heard the question too earlier, um, Mrs. Brussels, you said, you know, with the <coughs> high school, what would the social emotional, and I think just going back into what the goal was, I was re-familiarizing myself, I brought it back up, it's just that all students are connected to the school in some way, and we're trying to measure that by the annual stakeholder survey, so we're just trying to make sure that they have a club, they have a friend group, so it's, it's not um, a something that's taking time so much as a metric we're trying to change through our culture over time. 
Okay, we've had so good, good. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want to make a no, comment? No, I said well, I think we should vote. Yep, that, that's re gone. yeah. We've gone through some pretty good discussion, um, and we should do a roll call vote. I believe. Uh, Mrs. Quick Clark. question: Are we? Yeah. Is the motion going to be Amended? with the op mm -mm. with the opt out, or it's just as is? It's always an opt out, isn't it? Like if your child, if guidance is coming into your classroom and you don't want you like it's always an option yes. you send them a letter yes yeah we do so it's an option yeah. how far in advance is that letter sent i'd have to look to see is it two weeks it's usually two weeks in advance but we can we'd have to i'd have to look k through 12 to see when we send it counselors are saying about a week and a half to two weeks mm -hmm. is there, are we posting that letter online or that schedule online short of this i mean I knew they uh, they send the letter through Friday Flash. I don't know if it's posted online, but I'll have to work with Aaron on that. So that parents can, g I mean, hopefully we put the curriculum on our website and maybe the timeline when when they're in the classroom, so that parents mm -hmm. can proactively look. Right. This well, is the most detailed curriculum that we've. Sh I mean, again, this gets back to our curriculum conversation. This is design, was designed for counselors. That level of detail is how it was designed. So it gets a little bit back to where we were earlier of what that is. So now, I mean, this has been available now since January 20th of this particular. We have tweaked it a little bit, but that's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So okay. I guess I'm, I'm just confused now by that statement that the opt out's always been there. That's never been even said until now. What do you mean by? Well, what we just what we just talked about that has never been mentioned before. Maybe it hasn't that been that there's clear, like an inherent opt out. It's not an opt out. out. Basically, a letter is sent, and in the letter it says, "If you have concern or you don't want your child to participate, please reach out to your school counselor." The er the areas where so I would I would say this: HIV AIDS is an area of opting out. There are some health related topics or other topics where a parent approaches the teacher or principal <laughs> to say that they have a concern and they work through those with the parent or the teacher and they figure out what's happening there. It's not something that is a blanket, like, it, I mean, it's not been approached that way. When we do surveys, which are typically at the end of the year, those are voluntary. Those are anonymous. Those are not, re those are not required. So again, when it comes to this, this detailed curriculum is here for the purpose of this discussion. So Mike, Dr. Passwilly just said it's never been here before. This isn't the form or format with which we would communicate to our parents. They'd be like, what is this? It would be overwhelming. It would be very difficult to understand. So understanding the culture and context of where we are right now, it makes sense that we start to do some things in ways that are slightly different than the way we've done them before. So working together on some sort of like year at a glance and here are the topics and doing that in a way that the, can be managed effectively in the schools, I think we should do that. We've not done it in that same way. But I think that's, that would be listening to the feedback and hearing some of the concerns that are out there. I just don't know that we would handle it like week by week or like that's, it would be mapping some things out and trying to figure that out in a way that could be effectively managed. But Mrs. Papp has talked about and this happens typically when there's direct communication. Parents have talked to her. What is this? When she has the opportunity to speak to them, she's not trying to persuade or convince them. She's just explaining what it is. And nine times or 99 times out of 100, they're like, oh, okay, that's, you know, and then the school sort of moves on. So I think we would want to promote that kind of thing. What parts of this, I, I have had comments from um, family members that sometimes students can't they've asked for them to opt out and they're told no in what circumstances would students not be able to opt out I'd need to know specifics of what we're talking about there I, I mean I, I don't know too and many who's times making when, that decision uh, typically that would be if it's for something related to school counseling I'm assuming the parent and counselor are talking about that if there's questions beyond that the administrator building administrator would be involved so I'd want to know specifics and I think like when we have policy bound things that can happen so 819 for suicide awareness we're planning on delivering that lesson if it's something that is in a board document right and, and so I we've just had that be, discussion right I want to be clear so like I'm giving you an example of the letter that the middle school sent 
And in the letter, it's not a specifically an opt-out form, but in the letter it says, we understand that the presentation may be difficult for some of our students to hear at this time. Parents um, who would like their students to be excused from the responsible reporter education should notify their child's activity period teacher or counselor or, and go to the school library or the classroom session. And then Michael Rose and Jen Millay signed off on it. So like they can notify them, they can't go to the library or another location. So that does not, not happen with say. every counselor right. activity though. I mean, that's not, mm -hmm. we're not having that level of detail going out. Now that may be more to Dr. Miller's point of something that we structure in the future so there's a clear understanding of these are the topics these are approximately when and and here are the people you reach out to if you have concerns i think there's a fundamental thing here though that i mean in the spirit of hitting this deadline we're just we're we would be ignoring and i just have a question so i have a question um mr uh, hoffman so what i would have trouble doing right now is is um amending the motion to read something different because the motion itself references a plan and a curriculum that's attached and and if we were just to vote on the required component the counseling component or the the, uh, the career component thank you how would we do that how would we amend this motion because i'm not sure how it would be worded to do that well the amendment would be for the um the, the plan itself to be it's to be submitted to be limited to the career counseling components of it okay so I, I I don't have these two documents so I'm not sure which the plan and the curriculum that's, that would do it but yeah. okay. mm -hmm. that, that's the okay. amendment if the board is so inclined to make okay thank you All right. Let's local. Yeah. Mark are you going to make an amendment yeah, I'd like to make a motion to amend the motion uh, to include only the career uh, domain. Second. 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 Okay, we have an amendment to, um, and we have a second. It. And so, do we need a two thirds, or is it a majority vote on that? Majority vote. Majority vote on that. Simply be to amend the motion, and amend then if that passes, you have a subsequent vote on the amended motion. To then pass it. Okay. All right. Um, like a roll call, Phil? Yeah, let's, let's do a roll call, Mrs. Williams, on the amendment. For the motion to amend the motion, <clears throat> Mrs. Paterczyk? No. Mrs. Brusalis? Yes. Mr. Kashani? Yes. Mr. Cassidy? No. Mrs. Hillman? Yes. Mr. Weathorn? Yes. Mrs. For Fortier? No. Mrs. Miller? Yes. Mrs. Brusalis. Oh, no, I already I missed somebody. Mr. Mr. Morset. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes. Six yeses. Okay. Three no's. Motion Okay, passes. so it's been amended to pass. Now, so the amendment is there. The motion to approve the comprehensive K-12 guidance plan with vocational and career um, count, um, part of the plan. So we have a motion. motion. Do I have that second? You already have it on the floor. So you need a roll call of the amended motion. Okay. Well, we need a second, though, right? No? Okay. No. You just amended the motion. So that's what's on the floor for vote. Okay. Can you just repeat the motion, the new motion now? Yeah, the motion is to uh, approve the comprehensive, to approve the K-12 guidance plan, okay, and K-12 school counseling curriculum with reflect, with respect to the career and vocational requirements of the state. Was that limited to? <coughs> yes. Amendment okay. Yes. Can you please repeat? We understand, for administratively, we understand yeah. what's happening here. You only want the career part to go. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. And we're going to revisit the other parts at some other time, yeah. although you didn't say that out loud yet. Well, we will. Yeah, that's, that, we will. that's true. We will. Okay. So roll call, please, on the, on the vote. Mrs. Turchik? No. Mr. Morset? Yes. Mr. Cassidy? No. Mrs. Hillman? Yes. Mr. Kashani? Yes. Mrs. Brusalis? Yes. Mrs. Fortier? No. Mr. Weathorn? Yes. Mrs. Miller? Yes. 
I can remember. One, two, three. Six yeses. Okay, motion, motion, motion passes then to, to do that. Now, we do need to have further discussion. There, there's a lot of questions at the board. There's, there are in the community concerns, not concerns, and so forth, and, and the board needs to get comfortable with where we want to go with this. And so we got to come prepared with questions and understanding and not, not just feelings. But we've got to roll up our sleeves and make sure that we communicate effectively where our concerns are so that we can get to a common place where we can get an agreement. That, that's our challenge uh, with, with the board right now. So will this be on the agenda next on the <coughs> April 8th meeting, the, the other part of the prep plan? further discussions. Just as a discussion. This is the discussion to come with further questions to, to zero in and to make sure where we need to, where we, and, and, and basically it's not, you know, just like we did with the curriculum where the, the SLT and Dr. Miller heard what we were saying. They adjusted. They came back with some very good information. We saw that today, um, and that was a good discussion. So we want to have that kind of discussion the next time, too, so we can adjust, adjust that plan and go forward. Just one thing, like practically speaking, you know, what does this mean for tomorrow? What does it mean for lessons that are planned for our students? Can I? Is curriculum on hold? I mean, we didn't stop anyone else's curriculum that hasn't been approved yet right okay, so, so you're still carrying on as you are yes. today mm -hmm. just as you are today okay. we didn't yesterday. stop English 9 because it hadn't been approved I just was I was just clarifying so because sure. the staff's gonna have that question mm -hmm. well that, that's a good question yeah. yeah no you carry on as, as you would but to have the best informed discussion I think we want to have a representation of our counselors building administrators this speaks to more of a joint governance or committee structure than doing yeah. it in a regular meeting. We're just yeah, I, so I, I think you're right. It needs to be sooner rather than later would be my recommendation. Uh, there's not a whole lot of prep work that the team's going to need to be able to do. Like, they're ready to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. Student services. Wouldn't it be student services? It's fine. Right? Fine. Yeah, and, I, and I, this points back to the point we were making earlier, Mark about you know getting together a governance committee and so forth to to really drill down and come prepared to ask the questions and and get to the bottom of this so we can get to an agreement right that's kind of what we were talking about this is this is i think an example that we could utilize that for can we make those resources available mm -hmm. to the board members just to be clear what re specifically are you it's the videos. I mean, there's a, so there's a we can, I mean, so the answer is yes. There, that unit-based curriculum was not designed, it was designed to reflect what happens and it was brought visible to the board and the public per request in order to ensure there was clear transparency. I don't even know how many are on there or how, you know, in, in terms of the what, when, where, and how of bringing those forwards. Some of, I mean, The bucket filler book is an example. It's a resource that's there. It's a good book. When I say it's nothing, what I mean is there's nothing in the bucket filler book of anything other than how to fill someone's bucket. It it would be a it would be more gas to bring it over here than it. I mean, it's just so I'm I'm struggling with I'm not I'm yes is the answer. But I'm also trying to give you what I think you want, which is some sort of decision making. Is there something in there that? Isn't that why we're having this discussion? So perhaps, why not, but why not, why can't not a board member just it? make? Can we make a list of any materials you'd like to That's see and give it I'm to Dr. Pazin? And then I think the list is. Here, I mean, we, we've already seen zones of regulation. That's okay. been out for. That's public probably review. the most comprehensive thing in any of it. Correct. Mm -hmm. Zones of regulation is probably the thickest yes. thing we have. The mm -hmm. other ones are probably the more other children's ones books. Look like they're children's picture books, books or right. yeah, right. They we'll are, get them or read alouds of a children's book. That's so them out yeah. here yeah. and we will get you. We'll you have all the books and we'll yep. get through them in a half okay. an hour. I think so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, it, to, to close this off, because you could ask more questions, and what, what, here's what we need to do. Um, I believe this falls under student services. D does, does it not? And, and I, I know it was staff, but I think it was for the students. 
and yeah, you, yeah, you go back. And so, whatever, Ms. Hillman, you're 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 head of the the student services. So I, I think if we think about what Dr. Miller said, in our governance session, with thinking about putting together something and as a governance meeting to say let's get some people together or our board together not some people get the board together to have those kind of discussions now you know I leave it up to this, you know how we want to when we want to do this dr. Miller believes that we should do this as soon as possible so whatever the schedule can can you know allow for we would probably try to do something like that would you would you agree so you do want a joint governance versus a discussion item on the next agenda? Yeah, yeah that's what it, it's I, that, I think we should be very, We're going to need to add, add, pick a date, advertise the meeting. I think we're going to need to get the resources and give enough time. I mean, give you a chance, whoever wants to look at them, look at them before we have a conversation. Because the okay. conversation will be better informed. My only comment is I, I don't think the resources will take long to review. Is that fair? Okay. Mm -hmm. Ballpark, how much time will it take to get them? I can do it tomorrow. Okay. What about, what about um, 7 through 12? I'm sure it's not, yeah. Okay. So we'll today, to well, tomorrow. today is Monday. Um, we'll have them gathered and available here for board review by the end of this week. And so uh, if we need a Naviance login, if somebody doesn't have one, perhaps we can do that because some of the things are in Naviance, correct? Okay, perfect. And so I would say things like Naviance, unless other board members, like we've approved those. Like we continue to, I mean, okay. but I mean. Fine with me. I, hey, that's why I, I was asking the question. I would say if a board member wants a login to, I mean, a lot of us have kids, have had kids. I mean. That's why I was asking which resource. That's yeah. fine. If we I don't mean, need for Naviance. Me, the ones that have already come before the board are fine. But, but I'm one person. Let me use an example from Naviance. And I'm going to say it out just. I'm going to say it out loud. It's in the curriculum. But students do a form of like personality kind of, that's part of it. It is a student friendly thing. Like it's not a, it's not a psychological assessment to the, you know, we're not doing the Myers Briggs or something to that mm -hmm. degree, but the concepts are the same. It's been implemented forever, but it's in there. I don't want to not, I want to move forward in a way that can be productive and move forward and not too forward and then have to take steps back so just tell we just want to know what you want if you don't want something fine but we don't want to have to come back to it you know at some other time okay so we can Lisa you okay you okay we, we'll mm -hmm. put that governance meeting together and we'll get the questions we'll get the resources we'll together okay we'll do, do you want to look at a date now yeah because I have to advertise it All right I can't do before the eighth well so in the old in the old committee structure what one of the things that we didn't discuss committee meetings can happen at any time some districts don't operate in a committee structure at all some operate as committee of the whole which is the whole board all the time i mean there's different ways of of governing uh the the critical parts are that they're advertised they're open to the public they're transparent those are all the good things that happen um in terms of leadership and governance i think we come back with a date i i, I do i think we need some time to think i mean that's what it's so like. it doesn't have to be a monday is my point okay so when we used to have committee meetings w the part of the monday structure is out of consideration for the board Right, you know you Got give it. up Mondays, you're not giving up Tuesdays and Thursdays and, and we have to advertise, you know, we have to, we app I appreciate the staff not only being here but sticking uh, for a long night. We appreciate yeah. that tremendously. But we need to bring them back and we want them to be, have advance notice and figure that out. I just don't want it to go too far, too long before we schedule it. Okay. And we won't be back together as a team until April 8th. Okay, we'll, we'll come back with the date, we'll figure it out. A lot going on. Okay. Well, we're going to move on. Mike. You may take over again. Uh, item 8.03 is a motion to approve service agreements with Keystone Staffing LLC for paraprofessionals, school nurses, and school psychologists as attached. Second. We have a motion, and it's been seconded. Any discussion on this item? I do have a question, okay. question too. I don't know if we, it might be the same question. <laughs> okay. I'm looking at the contract for school psychologists. Let me just go in there. I believe it's on page two. And it says, um, 
includes but may not be limited to the following and it's completing the evaluations for students being considered for special ed and gifted do you anticipate that you would use those school psychologists beyond that purpose so the school psychologist would be with parent permission might be used for counseling services would be used for also they would also support um, testing for gifted screenings as well as testing for special uh, special education I have a question sure in the LPN contract it says there's two bullets on there one is observes observes for student health psychosocial and other related needs and refers student appropriately and then the other one there's one other one identifies and documents students with health problems and refers them to appropriate resources as needed. I'm wondering, is that within the scope of an LPN? That, that's so they can cover a health office under the jurisdiction of a school certified school nurse. So that's what we do now when we have sub, uh, substitute okay. nurses coming in. So that's not like that. some sort of diagnosis? No, sort that's of role. like what, you what, came in, I assessed that you had a headache, okay. I charted it in the student information system, and I referred you to your parent okay. for Tylenol. Okay. You fell, hit your knee, we're calling your mom, yeah. you may need to go to the urgent care. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure yeah. I understand what that is. Thank okay. you. Other questions? Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Discussion's over. All those in favor? Yes. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Item 8.04 is a motion to approve the staff attendance and application of Evan Clark, engineering and technology teacher, to participate in South by Southwest BattleBots Conference in Austin, Texas from Friday, March 8th, 2024 to Monday, March 11th, 2024 as attached. Second. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on this? All in favor? Yes. 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 All opposed? Okay, motion passes. Item 8.05 is a discussion information item. Um, is outlined in the 2023-2024 strategic plan goals. The district administration is currently reviewing the employees' policies, 300 listed below. When all the policies have been reviewed by administrators with potential solicitor review, in some cases, the draft guideline versions will be added to a public board agenda for information. Board members have the opportunity now and through the eventual final read of the proposed policy to remove that policy from the batch for specific discussion. Mr. Glickman, do you want to elaborate on that at all or? Sure, yeah, happy to. So, um Thank you, Mr. Wieselman. So, Mr. Morris, uh, Morris has referenced this earlier on item 2.01 as, as part of the short term goal for the board to review the 300 um, policies. Those all relate to employees. So, we have 44 policies <coughs> um, that essentially relate to area every area of employment, ranging from hiring to onboarding to evaluation to various leaves, um, including but not limited to all of those. So, um, we went through, we did close reads of all 44 of those. Um, there is within the public um, taste and section of the board uh, 32 that we have um, are recommending to to adopt as is in their current form uh, and an additional dozen that we have made um, some changes to some driven by ourselves some based on updates we received from the um, school board association uh, Pennsylvania school board association um, tonight uh, to Mr. McGordon's point information item right so the idea is um, if nobody sees anything like my recommendation sometimes we have policies where the changes are so substantive that we'll say hey let's pull this out and, and look at it in parallel to the rest of the batch uh, that's not my recommendation but that's a, a decision for the board to make um, what I would say is if nothing along those lines uh, would it take place beginning on April 8th we have our first read second read on the 22nd of April with a third read where we would adopt these policies uh, effective May 6th um, so I'll pause just to see if there, you know, um, if anybody's reviewed or if there are questions for uh, <coughs> the specific policies as they're currently drafted, or just request to say, hey, you know, what, you know, these ones we'd like to spend a little bit more time on. Well, that, and I appreciate you outlining the process here, so we know what lays ahead of us over the next three months to to get these done. Yep. I did have a question. Is that is it's the right time to ask a question about one of the yep. business? Okay. Um, in policy 340. Under, is under student welfare, um, that policy, I made my little note here. Um, there's a line that says employees shall not require students to perform services that might be detrimental. 
I was just wondering about the word services and perhaps it, the word tasks might be better. Do you see where I'm looking? I can't I imagine why a student would perform a service for a teacher. <laughs> no, and I, we actually did, so on the red line version, I'm not sure which did it fix it? we actually used the word tasks. Oh, so you like did, we, you fixed it. We did yeah. what you're suggesting. Awesome, you read my mind, awesome. I must have been reading the old one then. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> Any other I questions? Get this open on here. Okay. Talk about item 8.06 is an information item. A staff services governance meeting is scheduled for April 8th, 2024 to discuss the staffing process. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll go over the operational services. Um, <coughs> Leslie. Okay. Uh, this is a, an action item, item 9.01. The motion to approve the agreement with Time Clock Plus LLC for providing licenses and hardware maintenance and support as attached. Any, any further? Second. Yeah. Second. We have a motion that's been seconded. Any discussion? Okay. Um, all in favor? Yes. 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 All opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Okay. All right. Nine, item 9.02. Uh, is an action item to a motion to, to approve the contract for lease lit fiber WAN services for July 24, 2024 through June 2027 with Armstrong for the amount of $1,700 per month pre, pre rate pre, what's that word? And a one-time cost of $500. Second. Okay, we have a motion that's uh, been made and seconded. Do we have any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Yes. 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 All opposed? Okay, motion passes. Okay, item 9.03 is an action item, a motion to approve the purchase of a backup DIA 5 gig internet circuit from Armstrong Business Solutions with a recurring cost of $1,125 per month as attached. Second. The motion's been made and seconded. Do we have any discussion on this? Okay, all in favor? Yes. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Item 9.04 is an information item for board consideration at the April planning meeting, the motion to approve a renewal agreement with Sodexo with a guaranteed, finan guaranteed financial return of the amount to be determined for the fiscal year of 2024-25. <coughs> the specific contract lang language is to be negotiated with district administration with the final approval by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Uh, any discussion there? No? Okay. okay. Item 9.05 uh, is an information item for board consideration at the April planning meeting. The motion will be to, uh, to authorize the bid ad advertisement for trash and recycling hauling services. Our current agreement with Republic Services, Inc. will expire on August 31st of 2024. Following board authorization on April 8th, 2024, the bid will be advertised during the weeks of April 8th, April 15th, and April 22nd. The bid opening date and time will be Monday, May 6th at 10 a.m. A recommendation to award the bid will be provided at the May 6th planning meeting with board action requested at the May 20th meeting. Bid documents have been reviewed by Garing, Rudder, and Beam. Okay. Um, and um, item 9.06, information item. Um, Don't worry about reading that. That was yeah. just, yeah, just like <laughs> put that out during the springtime as a reminder of uh, safety practices around all of our campuses. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, um, we'll move on to uh, board business, uh, 10.01. Uh, we, we have an action item here, motion to approve making all administrative regulation ARs available to the public except those ARs designated by the administration as pertaining to district safety and security. Okay. Second. We have a motion that's been made and seconded. All, um, any discussion? Do we have a date when they're going? I know we, what was it, like April 1st or something? We'll try, we'll to, try to do it by the April 8th meeting okay. or right after. Okay. In early April. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. All those in favor? Yes. 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 All opposed? Okay. Motion passes. All right. School Culture and Diversity 10.02. Uh, it's a public presentation. I'll turn that over. Yep, we'll take that, uh, get you started. Uh, so um, as promised at the last meeting, we talked about uh, working with our core plus four team to develop this, again, required professional development. This is for staff. Uh, so we're gonna uh, take you through the presentation that we put together. We did meet as a core plus four team. 
receive some feedback, put this presentation together. Our plan for tonight is to share it so the full board has an opportunity to see it. Again, this is required professional development for our staff around trauma-informed approaches to instruction. Uh, listen to feedback and then make any modifications and then bring it forward for approval at April 8th and then implementation with our staff after that. So the first two slides that we've included here are actually not part of the staff training. We inserted them so that we could clarify with the board sort of the intent and purpose so that you understand that in this frame. So we're going to go through these two and then we'll get into the training itself. But uh, as Dr. Pasquinelli just mentioned, so chapter 49 governs what educators need to have as a part of their certification and so if they have not had something as a part of their collegiate experiences leading up to their certi certification we then have to provide that professional development to them at certain intervals so a part of the overarching umbrella of culturally relevant and sustaining education otherwise known as CRSE um, we landed on trauma-informed approaches to instruction in talking with the core plus four as these are the four criteria that would account for this requirement in the PA code uh, for our educators each um, year. And so we actually have right now requirements this year to do this this spring. And so what we've developed for you to see um, are the slides that would get us to that end. Just click it. So we did want to share um, when we were meeting with the core plus four as a part of the development of this, we were asked, you know, well, how are we meeting any of those other four requirements, right? So we landed on um, the rep proposed slides that you see highlighted in green that we'll be using with the staff hopefully um, this spring. But we do, um, on an annual basis, for number one, the approaches to mental wellness, have a podcast and a back to school kind of kickoff and a sign off on an annual code of ethics and a number of trainings that our professionals must do. A part of that are the continuum of services, um, MTSS, suicide prevention and awareness, all which would help um, count towards those um, criteria. We did hold um, in the past, in 2022, a training that was in conjunction with the AIU on trauma-informed approaches. So that is something that we did also attach the slides for uh, so that the public was aware of what those were. Yes, Mr. Stopener is showing, but we don't need to spend any, any time in there right now just for awareness sake. They are um, not a departure from what we're proposing at present. It is essentially um, getting back into um, the basics of trauma-informed approaches. Within technological and virtual engagement, we have not had in a number of years a specific focus on integration of technology. What we have done in the past is have a tech-infused lesson plan where the point was it's not technology for technology's sake, it's how is it enhancing the lesson and the learning and why did we select a certain um, resource over another and that all went within um, what is known as the SAMR model. Uh, we have not revisited that in a while, but we have maintained the continuity of learning website. Um, it's a Google site internally for our staff to do on-demand professional development. It um, has lived and actually been expanded greatly um, as we were trying to equip our staff with additional tools for tech integration during the, our, our online and virtual learning period where we were leaning heavily um, on our technology. And then lastly, um, cultural awareness and emerging factors that inhibit equitable access for all students in this commonwealth um, as number four, as one of the potential training topics. That is something that through the um, School Culture and Diversity Leadership Council and then through in-services that were subsequent to that, the discussions we had with the community, um, our building principals have led those at the um, building level in the past. That has not happened um, this year specifically. So that kind of gives you an idea of where we were um, in the past. Just moving into the way that we have to evaluate teachers here in Pennsylvania is the framework for teaching and learning. So as a part of their actual evaluation, uh, we are looking at this framework and within it there are four domains. In each of the four domains, there are also connections to um, being aware of um, trauma for students, being aware of backgrounds, um, different cultures, experiences for students and planning for them as a result. Um, on the next slide, Mr. Stobner. Looking deeply within um, each of those domains quickly, um, domain one relates really to all that planning and the offstage preparation that happens um, prior to a given lesson. And you can see that within the distinguished and proficient categories, which are where the majority, uh, vast majority of our teachers perform, um, you have to have knowledge of the cultural background and learning needs of groups of students um, to be able to plan for them and help them understand the information in a way that is accessible to them. Within domain two, 
uh, you're creating an environment of uh, respect and rapport, and you can see, again, understanding and accounting for the differences in the students, demonstrating caring, helping uh, meet them where they are. That is a part of what is considered proficient. Um, and then also beyond, if you, the obviously, obviously the absence thereof would be needs improvement or failing in terms of the PA tool. In three, demonstrating flexibility and responsiveness. Again, being able to adapt with what the students are showing and, and the way in which you're responding to them in the class as things arise. Um, any type of, um, we call that the on stage types of interaction. And lastly, in domain four, on the next slide, Mr. Sobner. There we go. Communicating with families. So understanding the traditions of, of the families, communicating with parents in a way that's accessible and having multiple uh, modalities of doing those communications. So that just sort of sets the tone for revisiting why are we here? We're required. There's a requirement this year. Um, it is a part of an overarching umbrella. We got to this place with the Core Plus Four as the next um, best area to begin um, in terms of where we could within that overarching umbrella. Dr. Justice, um, those four points of, um, that you made, are they part of a performance review for the teachers, or how are those four points? Those four domains that I just went yeah. over? So yeah, there are four domains. They no, actually, no, no, distinguished, proficient, needs improvement, yes. failing. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is a, the rating scale for every uh, um, one of the 22 components that are a part right. of their and overall. Right, and then so every teacher is rated, yeah. Correct. Yeah, I thought those were, were very good, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we want to get into the, the content. Um, so this is what we were proposing in terms of um, the agenda and overview. So this would be, now we're in what the teachers would be seeing um, in terms of the staff. So understanding trauma, the effects on the brain, trauma and real world experiences, and then what can they do with that in the classroom as a takeaway. We included this um, TED talk by Dr. Nadine Burke Harris um, several times for the board to see. Um, this is a part of the training that they need to undergo as well as board members within um, Pennsylvania. Um, but it goes through the ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and how those can result in trauma. Um, not for every person, and you know everybody has a different threshold in different ways, but there are things that we need to understand in terms of um, each of these ACEs categories. Um, where our students are coming to school impacted in various ways by each of these. And so we would begin with this 15 minute kind of overview for them and have them respond and answer to the question, you know, like why um, is understanding trauma essential to learning? And really it begins with, if you're not able to come to school, feel safe, um, be able to be, have your basic needs met, you're not able to then move on um, and be able to learn and focus on learning in, in within the school day. So that we would ask them to think about what is trauma, what does it look like to them, and then have them understand the definition which we've taken. Um, it's from a pencil, uh, Penn State course. You can see the um, course reference there. It's a free course that is available online. Uh, but this was the definition of trauma that we landed on. So results from an event, series of events, or set of circumstances that are experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or threatening, and that has a lasting adverse effect on that individual's functioning in each of those um, relevant areas. Also, we um, included the statistics. So 13 of every 30 students has had at least three of those kinds of um, experiences within their, their life. Dr. Paxson. So it talks a little bit, we talk a little bit about, sorry, I'm like, talk a little bit about trauma in itself. Is it single, is it isolated, is it, um, is it vicarious where you're seeing something on TV or is it something that is prolonged one thing after the other? and how it affects kids and really looking at that and just being aware, having our teachers have a general understanding and being aware of how they could best support their students. So looking at what are potential triggers of trauma, it could be something they hear, it could be something visual, it could be a smell. So making teachers aware of that and staff aware of like just the senses alone could trigger a trauma effect or behaviors in the classroom. What does that look like for younger kids? It might show, younger children might show behaviors where older kids, they, there might be avoidance or even withdrawal. So then there was a definition of trauma-informed approach in terms of what it means for a school, and it's really that we're aware and we're responding to and helping work with families and kids um, to be able to help them learn within the classroom and map them to any needs that they may have in their future. 
we then connect it to um, the brain imaging of a healthy brain on the left, um, a brain with an MRI after the effects of trauma on the brain, and thinking through the parts of the brain and the brain science behind it, uh, there's a diagram there, but then also a video on the next slide. Um, oh, there. two after, yeah. Video where they actually use um, the hand to describe kind of the parts of the brain and how um, your brain functions if it's in a, an altered state, essentially. Um, because of trauma, then you're higher functioning and be, being able to problem solve and reason is out the window. So, um, and just how that would impact students. And these are the responses that happen. So you're either, there's fight, flight, freeze. I think many people have heard mm -hmm. at least fight or flight. Um, freeze and fawn are also um, a piece of that. And that you begin having um, distorted thinking. So all or nothing, um, you're kind of living in a, a state of um, arousal thinking that something is a threat potentially around you when it's you know maybe perceived. Uh, it might not be something that is real, but because of the way that the science and the brain works, um, you're unable to move logically through a situation. And how it affects you in school specifically, where it might, if you go into the next slide, Sean, how kids might show they might shut down, where they might fight, they might skip class, they might daydream, they might sleep, they might <coughs> avoid activities, and where they might fight, they might show behaviors of impulsivity or acting out within the classroom. Okay, and then the la last part of the presentation is, again, adult learners, so trying to develop learning activities for the adults that they can use and implement in their classrooms. So these are the actual strategy conversations, if you get the next one. Uh, so a little bit of a brainstorming of, you know, what are the things that need to be in place for learning to occur? You know, we think of things like safety and routines and relationships that teachers would talk about. And then there's some resources there to, to further discuss that. And then think about what will that look like in their classroom as they, as they move forward. And then the next activity, if you go to the next slide, is um, looking at an article and it breaks down into different strategies like expect the unexpected, employ thoughtful interactions, be specific, specific about relationship building, and so on. And then each grade span would be thinking about what does that look like in this particular grade span. And then that, again, can be uh, Imp um, implemented in the classroom moving forward. So we want them leaving with strategies that they can use to support all kids, um, knowing that there's a range of needs in class in, in any given day. And I think that's, so those are just more of the strategies that come out of that close read. And I think that was one more. Yeah. Yep. So um, the last piece, so after um, Dr. Pasquinelli's point, there's the idea of coming up with con concrete strategies. Um, we want this to be practical for our educators who receive the training. And so the idea of um, reflecting first individually and then sharing out, essentially looking at their existing uh, practices that are already sort of best practice for trauma-informed instruction. Uh, and then also thinking about um, routines or procedures that could benefit from sort of revising and, and being adjusted, essentially to, to be mindful of potential triggers they you know, maybe hadn't considered previously. Um, following sort of that um, individual reflection and sharing out, the idea would be to uh, perhaps individuals commit to you know, two to three things that they could do concretely um, in the next week or so, um, so that we actually turn you know, sort of theory into practice in the classroom. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions on that? Went through and reviewed it this weekend. To bring that forward for approval. Yeah. At yeah. Mm -hmm. Went through this week and spent time with it, so it was good. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, moving on, item number 10.03. Um, Dr. Miller, your favorite uh, solar equipment. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to. I'll yeah. start. Okay, and I'll begin, talk begin. to Justice. Yeah. So, solar eclipse. <laughs> rare phenomenon here and the fact that it's happening the fact that it's tracking right over us so the challenge of this is it's two to four o'clock is the game is the estimate and that means pretty dark conditions during that period of time get going to be able to see the the challenge of that is what do you do and we're hearing different things here and we're hearing different things from other school districts the reality is you should not look at the partial eclipse. Someone keeps saying he's there's, a, there's a potential risk there. 
And the challenge for us is it's right in the window where we dismiss 4,600 students. So we're trying to figure out what's the best way to handle that. Um, and I'm not sure that we have a great answer for that. The <coughs> we have a, probably a recommendation. Mm -hmm. The recommendation is to not have school that day. So because of the change to 180 or 900, 990, we can do that. That's not a big issue. Second reason I like doing that, if I would say I like doing that, for our, st our professional staff, if we were to have a snow day or something like that that we don't have to make up, our staff does have some work responsibilities, our teachers, and our hourly employees need opportunity to earn those hours as well. We talked earlier about the curriculum plan and a prototype. If we take that day off, students would have it off and not make it up. Parents then could manage that experience for their kids and, and deal with that. We could use the time to implement the development of all the prototypes once we determine what that is. So we think we can make valuable use of that. The 8th is a Monday, which is positive. It would provide a three-day weekend for students and families. Again, it's not, it's not the best, um, but we think with all things considered, that's likely where we're going to be. Even athletic teams, it's not like they're, they're not going to be out on the field practicing, you know, during the, the time of the solar eclipse. Um, so that there will be athletic implications and all sorts of other things uh, based on timing. So we and didn't want to. It won't be it another one until yeah. 2045 and it won't come in our area. Yeah. <laughs> like these are like, uh, it's a total solar eclipse. Based on our 97% coverage. I've been talking with the Space yeah, Weather Prediction Center. So, very fa so <laughs> based kind of on stuff. one of our <laughs> department chairs for science who's not online, I don't think. I don't think this is scheduled to happen until the 90s. 2090s again where it's coming over us can anybody verify that is accurate okay yes mr Cauley, thank you okay so again this is sort of a, a rare kind of a thing i anticipate the closer school districts get to that the more there's going to be hurry scurry figuring out what they're going to do with it sort of planning ahead we think is the way to go again part of it makes me a little sad but also managing that during dismissal time for 4600 kids is also not great so I don't, I don't know that the board needs to act, but as long as you're comfortable, if we head in that direction, I'll take that as I'm seeing head nods. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So again, that we'll learn a little more, but mm -hmm. that'll be our game plan. We'll communicate in advance to families. We'll include some educational components, yes. things they can think about, to because this is a pretty cool thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you go to the planetarium next Friday, Friday, Friday. the last planet system that we <laughs> saw simulated literally exactly what's going to happen within the planetarium during this. Now you can stare at the ceiling because it's not the real thing, but <laughs> um, it, it's, it's really pretty amazing. So we don't want to miss the learning opportunity. That's the part that makes me sad. At the same time, we do think we can really make valuable, well, use, can, of, yeah. Yeah, valuable mm -hmm. use of the time and families can do that as long as we give them advance notice. Yes. Very good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, moving on to 10. Uh, 10.04 review of board workshop it's public it's an information item the board workshop was held before the combined meeting this workshop completed the onboarding requirements for newly elected board members as well as holdover board members okay moving on the meeting closings reports um, there are are 11.01 there are no reports that I know of and we will move now to 11.02 recognition of visitors mrs. Williams so I how many do we have I have three online and I have 10, but I think, I don't think there, everybody's here who signed up. Okay, so. we, um, we already did I did online. reach out to the people online to see if they still wanted to okay. speak. And I have some people who have already spoke, so I'm gonna go jump to the people who haven't, if they're still here. So, um, Ms. Rabadi, I don't believe is here, and she's one of the online people, so, and I have not heard back from her yet. Do you wanna try Ms. Rabadi? Hello? Can you my voice now? Oh. Okay. 
So the next person, uh, Laura Beth Matulovich, is she, is she here? Oh, there she is. I don't think I say that right. Hi, uh, my name is Laura Beth Matulovich. I live on Pierce Mill Road with my family. My daughter will be starting kindergarten next year. Um, I didn't prepare anything to say, um, but I have a couple of things. Um, one is that there is one board member here representing I think quite a few of us here in the community tonight um, who is consistently cut off interrupted and in general just not respected by the rest of the board members um, I watched everybody tonight you listen to everybody else and yet you consistently interrupt Miss Fortier not only do you interrupt her but you address her as Ashley when you talk to everybody else on the board by Mr. and Ms. Um, so, I mean, I think that's kind of disappointing behavior. Um, I apologize for my outburst earlier, but uh, it's very frustrating seeing somebody consistently interrupted <laughs> uh, when they're trying to, to make a point. Um, the other thing I would like to say is that my husband and I chose this school district. I mean, we, we chose where we lived because of this school district. I went to Uniontown Area High School. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that school district, but it does not have a great reputa reputation. Um, and, you know, 15 years later here, we thought, moving outside of Pittsburgh to, you know, what is considered an upstanding school district, um, we were not concerned about her education or the environment she was going to be in. But if you have a problem with emotion of regulation, I mean, you're picking a fight like with Daniel Tiger. Do you not watch, do your kids not watch PBS? Do you not let them watch Daniel Tiger? Like, what, what's wrong with emotional intelligence and emotional regulation? I, I have been suicidal since I can remember. I thought about killing myself before I had the word for it. When I learned about it when I was eight, I was like, oh, that's what that is. No one put that thought in my head. Um, and I came from an educated family, and I was a really good student um, you know I'm not one of the kids that you would think needed help um, but we didn't talk about feelings or acknowledge them in my family and if the only place that a kid can get respect 15 second and warning kindness is at school I mean shouldn't they be getting it there not every family is as wonderful as yours I, my family was wonderful but i still didn't have those resources okay thank you your time's up yeah. thank you thank, thank you. you for talking okay next speaker next please. speaker is chris bono i hope you all were were listening to that that was was very powerful um chris bono one kid in the school district um since someone mentioned earlier um i'm a white man as you can tell um but i'm not a victim we can all we can all get there you know um so i also actually would like an opinion from the new solicitor about this policy of not naming names because i'm not sure that actually is uh i mean it might be your policy but i'm not sure it's constitutional you're all elected officials if i want to stay up here and name your names all i want it's my three minutes so i'd like to actually get the uh new solicitor's uh opinion on that i'm the discussion tonight over the curriculum um, was really shocking. We had PhDs who in psychology and in counseling be disregarded by people with bachelor's degrees not in that. We had um, the suggestion that simply talking about things like if you talk about like depression that maybe that like causes you to be depressed. I mean that's like saying you know reading the Ten Commandments and talking about thou shalt not steal is going to make you steal. Or the election was stolen, and so we should all go to D.C. and participate in insurrection because someone said, the oh, wait, well, maybe that's not a good example. And perhaps the most 
shocking thing is this board, despite the <coughs> compromise offered by one member about an opt out, which already exists, and if people had done their homework, they would have known that. <coughs> when Dr. Sorry, when an assistant superintendent asked the board, what will change with this curriculum? And the answer was nothing. So we spent how much time taking a dump on our school counselors and the curriculum and putting kids, vulnerable kids, at risk and nothing's going to change? And I wonder, you know, when I was in, you know, I'm the same age as some of you and younger than some others, but when I was in, in school, we didn't have this kind of stuff, right? And I, I kind of wish we did because it would have saved me years of therapy later on. It would have taught me about empathy and not being, you know, cold and dead inside. Um, and, you know, I know some members of this board would benefit from that too. And so I really think that, you know, we really should embrace changes as they come and think about how we all could be better, well-adjusted people. And finally, I just want to say um, I want my kid to opt out of that eclipse day off. Um, there's no such thing as a three-day weekend when you have kids. They're just days schools are closed. So count me as an opt-out. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Next speaker is Sam Bailey. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Bailey. I live on Dennis Drive in Gibsonia. I have a fourth grader at Eden Hall. Um, I'm also a therapist. And I'm also a counselor educator. So probably someone who has a bit more experience than most when it comes to evaluating, um, you know, the, the, the arduous amount of classes and internships and practicums that school counselors have to go through to get their credentials. Um, and in the state of Pennsylvania, it's actually easier, and I'm using that term loosely, for a school counselor to um, also obtain their a certification as a licensed prof professional counselor than it would be for me as a licensed counselor with a PhD to become a school counselor. Why is that? Because their programs, their degrees set them up to be well equipped, right, in the world of um, all the things we've talked about tonight, but not my degree, right? I'm, I'm not qualified to be a school counselor. And, and I want to be clear, that doesn't mean that school counselors are being um, educated to become licensed professional counselors, but they are able to pursue that, again, much easier than myself. So just for clarification, right? Feels to me like somehow after all of this time, we are wildly like, still confused about what social emotional learning is and isn't. And that's disappointing. Right? That's just really disappointing because what I'm seeing here tonight is, you know, um, documents, curriculum, forms that have been available contrary to process or policy or procedure, I don't really care, right? Those things were accessible. So it's just disappointing and it feels like a waste of time to continue to pick through these things when it could have been done a long time ago, right? State requirement for suicide prevention, right, in our schools to, to imply in any kind of way that it wouldn't be relevant to have that added in to any sort of social emotional learning curriculum is despicable. It's disgusting. I'm not naming names, right? Not. That pie graph that came up several hours ago at this point, the one where um, there was a portion that seemed off balance or unbalanced, that doesn't need to be looked at as failure. That's real life for school counselors, right? Their life is a pendulum. Every day is different for them. I'm not sure if any of you know that, right? So that's not a failure. That's them attending to issues that warning. need attended to. So I don't even know if the one that's perfectly cut into thirds is realistic, right? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker is Rebecca Hoffman. Hi, everybody. My name is Rebecca Hoffman. I have five kids in the district, one in every building. I hope they're all asleep. I don't know if they are. Um, I have two tidbits to add to the conversation from tonight. Um, one is the amount of time that a counselor is in front of children under the proposed plan is less than the time that we spend in this meeting tonight. Number two is, 
You said earlier that all kids have parents, and that is mostly correct. Some kids lose a parent acutely, which puts the remaining parent into crisis and grief. Some kids are raised by other family members who may not understand the current trends, and some have unrelated guardians. It's unfair to say that every, parent, every child has a parent who's able to look out for them in the way that we are able to do. But really, what I wanted to say when I signed up was that I want to say thank you to the school counselors for the work that they do every day. I wanted to say we appreciate the school counselors, and I wanted to say that I trust the school counselors to do the job they are trained to do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go back to the online callers that we haven't heard from yet. Um, first one being Ann, Ma Ann Myers. I did hear back from her, and she does want to speak. She does? Is that what she said? you're trying to reach is not available at the tone please record your okay if you want to go to Ms. Ravati she did reply to my email and she does want to speak I don't know. It's, it's you. We've tried twice. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I do have others who have spoken but have signed up to speak again. Right. As long as their speech is not the same as it was before, it's something different, then we can take that but according to policy. Okay. okay. Mrs. Dawson, are you here still? I saw her leave. Lauren Edwards? Laura, I just asked to keep the subject different than what you spoke to before. Yes, I, I have a strict rule about never speaking twice, but I do want to put something on record after okay. the discussion tonight. Um, at one point, a member of the board brought up a comment about opting out. He, he wasn't sure that that was an option. It was communicated that opt-outs are acceptable in these counseling scenarios. And I, I do want to put on record that after the trusted adult lesson in my son's first grade class in September of this year, my very first response was to opt my child out. And I was told I could not. I have it in writing. Um, I'm not saying it for any other reason than it is important to get these details right. It's important to understand what the rules are. And it's important that the people um, interacting with the parents understand what the rules are maybe the person who told me that didn't realize that I could um, but that was a really you know stressful situation and I felt pretty helpless without any resources at that point um, I also think we need to be very thoughtful about opt-in versus opt-out because you know the, the counseling curriculum is above the state standard I mean we've heard that and good or bad it doesn't matter it's above and Parents should be thoughtful and request to have their children in that because opting a child out is very isolating for a kid. They have to go away from everybody else and maybe they don't understand why and it seems kind of needless to do that. Um, I know these aren't popular opinions but we have to be balanced here and the reality is not all parents want to participate. We need to protect those parents, their members of the community and taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you. Allison Duncan. Is she here? Allison Duncan, back up here again. Um, I just wanted to point out, around 8.30, um, there were a lot of interesting comments made. You were all talking about the Finance Committee, and we heard a lot of you mention the importance of experience, recognizing um, finance-related careers, 
expertise. So you showed appreciation for experience and expertise when you were talking about each other, um, but you failed to extend the same courtesy to our school counselors. And I just hope that you will think about that because they know what they're doing. They're trained to do it. You're not trained counselors. Um, this counseling discussion was the epitome of micromanagement. Um, that's been brought up several times before. I believe it was mentioned at the last meeting, um, the academic achievement meeting, that you would stay out of the weeds. Uh, this was so far in the weeds, you're going to have to call the grounds crew to pull you out. Um, I just had a few other things. I'm not sure what the point of the um, advisory council is, if you're just going to override um, their input. That was including students, teachers, community members, board members. Um, what's the point of that? You're not going to listen to them and their recommendations. And um, the resources. Why did you wait to ask for resources? I feel like that was intentional. Um, you had no questions at the January meeting. You've had all the time between then and now. We're talking about from January 22 or even before that. If you wanted to see the resources that are being used um, for SEL, why did you wait until tonight to request them? It doesn't make any sense to me, and unless you were planning to kick the can down the road. And uh, how does opposing academic and social emotional counseling help kids? Remember, your job is to make decisions to help kids. Let's see, I've got 56 seconds left, so I'm gonna tell you that um, social emotional learning has been really important for one of my sons. He had to manage intense emotions um, from a very young age. He really struggled with that. It affected everything, like especially at school. He would get upset about very tiny things, and he didn't know how to regulate his emotions. Um, it, he would end up having to be pulled out of the classroom, <coughs> and he received help for that. He learned eventually over time. Um, and by the way, we did have him in outside therapy, so he was getting that help, but he needed assistance in school. He needed people that he could go to in school that could work with him because the teachers warning. were busy. So I just wanted to say he's um, very successful as a college student right now, but he needed that help as well as organizational help. Very simple things that have made a difference for him. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Next, Katie Postrich. Is she here? Oh, there she is. <coughs> Hi, Katie Postridge again. Um, I just wanted to clarify a few things based on what I said before and after the discussion. So um, I already told you a little bit about my kids and the thing I wanna make sure that you understand is that each one of my kids has required SAP intervention at different points in their lives. It's not something I'm proud of. I mean, like I was devastated when they, when they were needing help. I, as like the perfect student, the perfect, you know, went to school, have a successful job, I was embarrassed. My kids were a little bit embarrassed. The school made it so easy. They got my permission. They explained what it was. They answered any questions that was entirely possible. The counselors were amazing. I mean, it started in kindergarten and it's still going in ninth grade <laughs> with one child. It's been at various interventions other times throughout for my other kids. And I cannot speak highly enough for the counselors and their intuition and knowing what to do. And some of it was because I said, you know what, this is a conversation I heard my kids talking online with friends about stuff that's happening at school. I don't know what to do with it. Can you help me out? Can you like check in with my kid and see? And from there, things blossomed but they've never done anything without our permission. This, the high school recently, and I put it out on the Facebook parent page <coughs> because people don't read the flashes. They don't read the stuff. They act like they don't know that there's opt out things. The high school did a suicide presentation. It was available to parents. You could go, there were five of us maybe with counseling staff, principals, there were probably five parents out of the entire high school that went to listen to the presentation that was going to be presented to their kids and there was an opt-out form that went with that email. I don't know, maybe they did opt out and that's fine. I have no issues <coughs> with that, but like 
to say that those things might not be known, I think, with the intent, with the other comment that came saying that, you know, parents need to be responsible and understand what's going on, and they need to be the ones making those decisions to opt in or opt out and they don't know so you should opt in rather than opt out because you know it doesn't make sense the the district communicates very clearly you know i haven't been home yet <laughs> i haven't seen my kids these people spend way more time with the kids with my kids during the week than 15 I do. second warning so you know for them to come to me and say i trust all of my people at school i trust my teachers i trust my counselors i can go to so many people it's working. Their lessons are working. So please strongly consider. Okay, time's up. Thank you. Everything. Thank you. Mike Barber. What's up, Mike Barber? I have a strict policy of speaking two times every meeting. Um, so I'm going to follow through on that. Um, Dr. Miller. Thank you as always, Dr. J, Dr. P. I appreciate everything that you guys do. Um, I was wondering if we could have a parent checker for how many parents actually read that curriculum that all the teachers and admin are going to put all those hours in. Because I don't see many parent participation, including some of the board members. Like There are opportunities, as I've said, to join in and be more involved. I'm here every single meeting. I speak twice every single meeting. I volunteer within the school. Some of the board members benefit from the time that I donate to the school, and yet they do not own the fact that they're supposed to respond to people that email. I have not received email from two out of three of my representatives from my last email. Thank you to the the individual that did respond. Um, I very much appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> I literally share property line with one of my representatives. And she avoids having a neighborly con conversation at all costs. I am outside all the time. I'm here all the time. Anybody that wants to have a conversation, I've met with certain individuals on the board, off the board. I'm not attacking anybody. I like to ask questions, just like you guys. If I ask questions, how come I'm not getting answers? Why is it okay for you guys to ask questions, but when I ask questions, it's, I don't want to answer it. I'm going to ignore that email. And again, it's not all of my representatives but it is absolutely 100% one, and I have received an e a response from my neighbor. But it would be a lot easier if we had these conversations, and I'm available. So anytime anybody wants to walk on over to my house on Richland Road, you come on over and I'm likely outside playing freeze tag with my kids and the neighborhood kids, and we can have a conversation. And I just want to say again, I appreciate everybody that's here. This is, this is midnight. You guys are crazy. Um, I really appreciate uh, that the counselor stayed till 11. Um, some teachers were here. Uh, principals were here. It was impressive to see the participation from our staff that is going to implement what you guys discuss on a day-to-day -day basis. Have a good night. We have one more person who's online, and Mr. Stobener, Brittany Kindersmith. Hello. Hello? Hello. You're on with the board. Hi. Thank you. I wanted, oh, sorry. This is Brittany Kinder Smith. Um, I have two kids in the district. I wanted to say thank you to the board members who, um, you know, declined the motion to amend the original motion earlier regarding the counseling curriculum. Um, like 
Mr. Barber, I also um, have questions about things that I do not receive responses to from two of my three representatives. I did receive a response from a representative who served on the counseling advisory committee, um, and I really appreciated that um, discourse that uh, that board member engaged in. Um, like Mr. Bono, I am walked all of a sudden it is being brought up that we can address elected officials by names in these public meetings, um, especially because community members who are not elected officials have been mentioned in emails from board officials. Um, I wanted to just say that as, as a parent, both of my kids are in K through three, and I have received notification about the, um, so I guess what would, what is considered the tier one, um, like part of the curriculum. So like the bucket filling, um, the zones of regulation <clears throat> and I, I know there was a community member who, you know, tried to opt out and I really hope that that, you know, was handled and that they were able to do that. It is my understanding based on the communication that that is an option for, for me at the elementary school that my kids go to, which is Um Anyway, as we move forward, hopefully you look like they're going to put this on the agenda soon. I'm not sure why we couldn't pick a date for that this evening. Um, that is concerning to me to just leave it in limbo like that. Um, but I do hope that you will consider where the community support is coming from and what the majority of people are saying. Um, 15 second warning. The plan as it was, and that you will pass the plan as it was written. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. That's it. That's it. Okay. All right. Uh, Twelve point oh. zero one adjournment <laughs> of the meeting. Mark's ready to go. Oh my God. I know. I like what it was like. And zip up my jacket. <laughs> Mark, thanks for a minute. Thank you. That's where I was. See you tomorrow morning. I might just Thanks. spend the night here. <laughs> At least there's a little bit. I know. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.